Lone Star Park in Grand Prairie, Texas, outside Dallas, site today of what is annually the world's biggest single day of thoroughbred racing and what is unquestionably the biggest day in Texas racing history. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Costas, Tom Hammond and the gang in a moment. You know, when you think about the place that horses occupy in the imagination of many Texans and their place in the state's history, it's almost hard to believe that for half a century, there was no thoroughbred racing in the state of Texas until a 1987 referendum restored paramutual betting. Since then, thoroughbred racing has progressed gradually here. Until today, it takes a quantum leap with many of the world's finest horses, jockeys, and trainers combining to make the Lone Star State, for one day at least, the capital of racing as Texas hosts the Breeders' Cup. of Texas have never seen anything quite like it. The Breeders' Cup has come to Texas and Lone Star Park has been transformed into a championship venue. It's the ninth different track to host the Breeders' Cup, the newest, it opened in 1997, and one of the smallest. But people in this area have really embraced this event and after a Texas-sized request for tickets, the track has erected nearly 40,000 temporary seats all around the track, giving it a bit of a NASCAR look and pushing today's crowd past 50,000. It's rained off and on all week in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's been in the 80s, which is warm, especially for those horses coming from cool weather areas. But today, Breeders' Cup World Championship Day is gorgeous, absolutely perfect weather. The temperature is a pleasant 70 degrees as we approach the first Breeders' Cup race. Low humidity. The track is good, but drying out. It'll be fast, I feel, for most of the races today. The turf course is yielding. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lone Star Park, Grand Prairie, Texas, not far from the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. I'm Tom Hammond. This is the 21st Breeders' Cup, and in the first 20 years, it's become one of the top sporting events of the year, drawing most of the best thoroughbreds and jockeys from all over the world. And today's eight-race, $14 million card will decide most of the year in championships and horse of the year. It's all capped off, of course, by the $4 million Classic, which has its deepest field ever. And joined now by Charlesy Canty. And Charlesy, uh, we mentioned that it's been warm weather here in Dallas-Fort Worth. That means horses coming from the Northeast, from Canada, and especially from Europe, have a big adjustment to make to these warmer temperatures. Well, you're right, Tom. A lot of these horses are stepping off the plane with a little extra hair on them. It's sort of like us going to a tropical climate and getting off the plane right. with a sweater on. So it makes the decision of whether to clip and when to clip really important because a clip job on a horse is just like us getting a haircut. The difference between a good one and a bad one is about two weeks and a cold snap can make them sprout their winter coat overnight so the timing has to be just right most of them if they were going to be clipped were clipped before they got here but one filly got a full body clip on wednesday that's society selection in the distaff but she looks great you can't tell she's just been clipped well, you know, what? last year, the temperatures leading up to the Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita were in the hundreds. And we said, well, forget about the European horses. It'll be too hot for them. They don't have a chance. Every time I looked up, it seemed like they were winning a race. So we'll see how the heat plays out today. First race is the Distaff, presented by Nextel. And here are the odds. A shot of 7 to 2, the three-year-old filly. Edel Love at 24 to 1. Tam Wheel at 8. Society Selection 6. Nebraska Tornado from Europe getting some play at 5 to 1. Hollywood Story 39 to 1. Storm flag flying two to one at the moment. Indy Groove is 53. Bear Necessity is another long shot, 56. Island Fashion, seven to one. And Stellar Jane is 13 to one. And not only are the best horses in the world here, but the best jockeys are here too. And the jockeys getting ready for that first race, the distaff in the jockeys room now, and getting ready soon to make their appearance here on the track. In fact, looks like they're heading out now. They'll go to the paddock to get their riding instructions from the trainers and then mount up for the first Breeders' Cup race of the day. And you have to think that even though these are very experienced jockeys, you see Jerry Bailey there in the Phipps colors of black and cherry. And uh, even though they're very experienced jockeys, most of them ridden at this level before, not Kerwin John, who just goes by on the black there, but most of them feel the butterflies despite their long experience. Well, our reporters are in the paddock as well. Let's go down now to Kenny Rice. 
Thanks, Tom. Alan Jerkins is known as the giant killer. He is the man who twice in one year trained horses who defeated Secretariat in 73. And then in 98, he trained another long shot to knock off eventual horse of the year, Skip Away. He brings to this field today society selection. Not necessarily a big long shot. She is at six to one. A filly that has won at seven furlongs and a mile and a quarter in grade one competition this year. I asked Mr. Jerkins just a few minutes ago, would you rather come in here with a real long shot that no one's noticing or be in here with your six to one shot that people are taking a good look at as she has never finished worse than third in eight races this year. He said, I'm just happy to be here. And if I win it, I may be putting on one of those Texas size 10 gallon hats to celebrate. Now let's go over to Bob Newmeyer. Well, thanks. I'm with Hall of Famer trainer Suge McGahey, who's saddling the favorite now, Storm Flag Flying at 2-1. to one. Can you confirm that this will be her last race on the track, Suge? Well, I would have to think it's going to be. I mean, that's what our plans are. She's going to Claiborne on Monday and breed her to AP Indy. Maybe if, maybe if she wins, maybe I'll be able to talk, to, talk him into going for the record. But right now, it's, uh, she's planning on going home. Her mother? won a Breeders' Cup race, My Flag, the Juvenile Phillies. Her second dam was Personal Ensign, who won 13 in a row and perhaps put on the greatest show ever in the Breeders' Cup. What has this family meant to you and the Phipps family? Well, not only to me, but the Breeders' Cup, too, you know, because we keep bringing it up, you know. Well, it's been great, you know, to have her to be able to win a, our first Breeders' Cup race and then for, you know, her daughter to come back and win the Breeders' Cup two-year-old and then for her daughter to come back and win, you know, it's it's been fun. You know, it's thrilling to compete on this, on this day and you know, to be able to have the things out of personal incident that have been as good to us makes it even that much better. Good luck, Shook. Thank you. Three generations of Breeders' Cup champions, Tom, and the first horse to ever win two different races if Storm Flag Flying can win the distaff here this afternoon. All right, Bob, and she's also the first one on the track. She comes out early. She can be a handful at times. So to settle her down, to keep her uh, under control, she and Jerry Bailey come out on the track before the others are in the post parade. Storm Flag Flying, who is currently the favorite. Let's go back to the paddock now and join Mike Battaglia. Thanks, Tom. And with Storm Flag flying already on the track, the second favorite in the race is the one horse, Ashado. Now, if Ashado wins today, she's going to break a couple of losing streaks of sorts. Uh, Ashado won the Kentucky Oaks, one of the most prestigious races for the three year old Phillies back in May at Churchill Downs. She'll be the 10th runner to, to win the Kentucky Oaks to try to come back and win the distaff. So far, their record is a dismal zero for nine. So that's as a three-year-old, when the distaff as a three-year-old. And Todd Pletcher, he's 0 for 12 in the Breeders' Cup. But you know what? These Both of them, Pletcher and Ashado, have excellent credentials. Pletcher, one of the top trainers in the country. Ashado has raced 13 times, eight wins. She's never been worse than third. She does a deserving second choice in here. Probably might even be the favorite before the race goes off. She's got the tactical speed. She's got the inside post. And it's going to take a lot to beat this Philly Ashado. And we could see two losing streaks come to an end right here, Tom. All right, Mike, the order has given to riders up from the paddock judge, and the jockeys get a leg up, and we'll head toward the track. They come, there's Hollywood Story, one of the long shots. They come uh, through a tunnel onto the track, and uh, we'll make their appearance. There's a, take, a look there at number five in the Judmont Farm Colors, Nebraska Tornado, ridden by Edgar Prado. She is... Uh, definitely a group one horse as you see in Europe one of the best coming over here to try the dirt and taking on the US horses and uh, she can be a handful too. we'll keep a close eye on her at the start very talented filly but often reluctant to load into the gate so we'll see how that goes today now our next tell call to the post Just, there we go. And so far, Nebraska Tornado seems to be acting okay. It's the loading in the gate that she usually objects to. They're going to blindfold her to load her today, so we'll take a look at that when it occurs. And Charles C. Candy, as we look at these Phillies uh, in the paddock, getting ready to make their way to the track, Todd Pletcher going by there. Um, notable absentee is Azari. 
Well, indeed, there was much debate as to whether Azuri would run here against her own sex in a mile and an eighth, a race that she is quite capable of winning and has been only beaten once at that distance, or would she take on the males at a mile and a quarter in the Classic? And that's what owner Michael Paulson has opted to do. And the joke was that the collective sound we heard on Wednesday was the sighing of relief of all the trainers of these hillies that she did not indeed go in the distaff. So that leaves the race quite wide open up for some of these other fillies now to step up without Azari shadowing over them. And it was a controversial decision, but we will be seeing Azari in our final race of the day, the $4 million classic. And of course, our first race is the Breeders' Cup Distaff presented by Nextel. Grade one race with a purse of $2 million, fillies and mares, three-year-olds and up over a mile and an eighth. And a field of 11 set to go to the post as you look at Island Fashion go by. And the horses for the first time ever parading on this Lone Star track for a grade one event an historic moment for the little track in Grand Prairie Texas which has become the center of racing in the world on this day and Nebraska tornado number five already is showing a, a little anxiousness you see her prancing a little bit there and she's the one we're focusing on here to see just how she acts of course you can expend so much energy acting up before the race that you have none left for the actual running as we look at uh, the Todd Pletcher trainee Ashado and her jockey John Velasquez Number one is a shadow, the three-year-old filly, winner of the Kentucky Oaks, who could rack up the divisional championship today. Second in the juvenile fillies last year, and she could give Todd Pletcher his first Breeders' Cup win. A shadow has been in the money all 13 starts. Number two, Allo Love, second to adoration in this race last year, trying to become the third filly to run second, and the next year win the distaff. The others were Life's Magic and Lady's Secret, but Allo Love has only a win in four starts this year. Number three is Tam Wheel, co-owner Turf Express, based in Gainesville, Texas. Number one, a great at stake, but was second to a Zeri in the Spinster at Keeneland, which has produced eight distaff winners more than any other race. Number four, Society Selection, three-year-old filly trained by the Hall of Famer Alan Jerkins, who over his legendary career has never won a Breeders' Cup race. Society Selection, 10th in the juvenile fillies last year. This year, she beat Ashado in Saratoga's Alabama Stakes, second to Sightseek in the Bell Dame. That was her first start against older mares, but she is 0 for 3 outside New York. Number five, Nebraska Tornado, the sixth European-based horse to try to do staff. Not have been better than fourth. She has never raced on dirt. And trainer Andre Fobb's wife, Elizabeth, was here from France to saddle her in the paddock. Number six, Hollywood Story. George Kerkorian, the owner, owns movie theaters and names his horses with movie themes. She was fourth in the juvenile fillies as a maiden last year. She's been off 119 days, which would be the longest layoff ever for a Breeders' Cup winner. Storm flag flying, not in the post parade. She came out early. There she is over on the back stretch. It's her last race, and she represents three generations of Phipps family Breeders' Cup winners. She won the 2002 Juvenile Phillies. Her dam, my flag, won the 95 Distaff, and the great personal ensign won the 88 Distaff. Her grand dam, all trained by Suge McGahee, who this year went into the Hall of Fame. Indy Groove is the eight, trained by Gilmer, Texas native Tom Proctor. His dad, Willard, trained in Texas in the 30s before racing was banned in the state. This is Proctor's second Breeders' Cup starter. His first was one dreamer who won the distaff 10 years ago at 47 to 1. Number nine, Bear Necessities, owned by Texas native George Middleton's Iron County Farms. She's winless her last seven starts. This is likely her last race before being retired. One of the long shots. Number 10, Coming into your picture in a moment is Island Fashion, winner of the Lady's Secret, her last start. And earlier this year, she was second against males in the Santa Anita Handicap. That's the best finish for a mayor in the 67-year history of that event. And number 11, Stellar Jane, a candidate for champion three-year-old filly. She beat a shadow and society selection in the Mother Goose, was second in both the Coaching Club American Oaks and the Alabama. She's facing older mares for the first time and trained by the all-time leading Breeders' Cup trainer, D. Wayne Lucas. And that is the field for the Breeders' Cup Distaff presented by Nextel. At NBCSports.com, viewers can take part in online cyber capping of each race, match their picks against those of our handicappers, Bob Newmeyer and Mike Battaglia. Plus, fans can click on a special interactive on how to handicap the Breeders' Cup Classic and also view replays of all today's races. That's all at NBCSports.com, so you can play along with us here today.
Now let's go down to our handicappers and see who they like for the distaff. Let's go to Bob and Mike. Well, thanks, Tom. And the $2 million distaff, the first Breeders' Cup race to be run in the state of Texas. And I'll tell you what, this race changed dramatically when Michael Paulson and Wayne Lucas opted for the classic with a Zeri. She would have been four to five or less to win this race this afternoon. But with her out, I think it's wide open. No, and then you have to look for the three-year-old fillies. And they've been beating each other all year, particularly back east. And I think the perfect example to show you Three contenders in this race, the Alabama Stakes at Saratoga. We see on the outside, Society Selection. She's going to win this race, and she's my pick today. She beats Stellar Jane in the middle, that's the gray, and a shadow in the gold cap towards the rail. Now, I picked this horse last year, Mike, in the juvenile fillies, and I think she ran 15th, beating about 40 lengths, but I'm stubborn, and I'm coming back with her today. You know what? Any of those three can win. Storm Flag Flying can win. I couldn't separate them, so I went, you're not even going to believe this, I went for a European, Numi. A European? <laughs> a European? Never European. run in the dirt before. And there she is right there, Nebraska Tornado. I like a lot about this filly. She's running seven straight Group 1 races, and she's run well, especially against the males. Four times she's raced against the males. She She's much better when she races around turns. All four of her wins have come around the turn. She's 0 for 5 when she runs on straightaways. Now, she does act up at the starting gate. If she doesn't act up today, I actually watched her in the paddock. She act up, acted up a little, but she was fine in the paddock. And I really think she's a live shot in here. I thought she'd be a bigger price right now. She's up there at 6 to 1. I'm taking Nebraska Tornado. It's wide open. Co-favorites at 5 to 2. Storm flag flying at 3 to 1. Tom, anybody's race. Typical Breeders' Cup. That's right, Bob. The fans can't even separate them. Co-favorites at the moment, but the fans online the cyber cappers like storm flag flying 23 percent a shadow 20 percent and island fashion 17 percent go for her bob likes society selection and mike nebraska tornado approaching our first breeders cup race the distaff the breeders cup world thoroughbred championships are brought to you by dodge you can take life as it comes or you can grab life by the horns by bessemer trust enhancing private wealth for generations by John Deere nothing runs like a deer and by Nextel done back at the world thoroughbred championships the distaff presented by Nextel a purse of two million dollars on the line and here are the current odds the shadows at five to two storm flag flying now up to seven to two so a shadow is the favorite as the horse's head for the starting gate. And there's Storm Flag Flying, who's been out a good uh, seven minutes or so before the others came out early. But she's used to that. This will be the first Breeders' Cup race run at Lone Star Park, the main track, a mile in circumference. So they'll start just before the finish line, go once around, and then finish up this mile in an eighth race. Let's go down to Donna now. Donna, first of all, how's the track been playing? It's listed as good. Well, the track is listed as good. It got some rain last night, Tom, as you well know. I talked to one of the local riders, Casey Lambert, who rode in the first race of the day, and he really thought the track would be dried out within a couple of races and be an absolutely fair racing surface, but did think it might not be conducive to front runners for the first couple of races on the dirt. I guess we'll see. Corey Nakatani did, rode in the first race also. He didn't seem to think it would be fair to front runners all day long, but... And there's Nebraska Tornado, well, Donna Brothers, uh, we'll see what blindfolded, happens. and she does not want to go in the gate. In fact, Edgar Prado just got off her, and they're going to try the assistant starters to put into the gate. What do you see from out there on the track? Well, I see what you saw. The uh, rider just got off of her. They do have her blindfold on right now, and she's not being very cooperative. Um, and Actually, she's froze up. They've got a couple guys behind her doing what we call a lock and load. They lock their, hinds, or their hands behind her hindquarters and try to literally just push her into the gate but right now they're uh, close to the gate but it doesn't look like they're in there yet um yeah now looks we see like her they going are in. in donna now they got her in they, they are in, in the, and i will say the only other two fillies who were tough to load are also both in that's a shadow and storm flag flying so we might be in good shape you see edgar prado now climbing back aboard nebraska tornado as they continue to load there's indy groove championship it's on the line here. Very much so. Not only uh, the older fillies, but the three-year-old championship as well. A lot depends on the outcome and is how Azari runs in the Classic. All right. For the call of the distaff, let's go to Tom Durkin, the man who has called every Breeders' Cup race in this, the 21st edition. Tom? Thank you, Tom. And the final horse, Stellar Jane, moves into line. Ready for the start. And they're off. And the shadow breaks a little way down toward the inside. Tamwe with early speed today. Ella Love backs off just a little bit. 
Indy Groove is there on the outside, and Nebraska Tornado, the French Philly, is forwardly placed. So they make their way for the clubhouse turn. And it will be Tam Wheel to take the field there. Tam Wheel in front. Nebraska Tornado runs in second. Indy Groove through wide third. A shot has got a good spot in the early going. She's a ground saving fourth. Ello Love is fifth. Hollywood Story is racing in sixth position. Island Fashion moves up four wide round the first turn, advancing from seventh. And Society Selection is now eighth toward the inside, but she's only about five lengths from the lead. Then Bear Necessities, Storm Flag Flying is second to last, and Stellar Jane trails the field. 22 and four fifth seconds over this track at Lone Star today. They're moving right along here. Tam Wheel short lead, Nebraska Tornado keeping that pressure on all the way. The long shot Indy Groove with the pacemakers running three wide. Island fashioned, poised for the final half mile on the far outside. They ran a half in 46 and three fifth seconds. So the field moves into the far turn now. Tam Will still on that lead. Tam Will trying to take it all the way on the lead. On the outside, Island Fashion now makes that final move for the lead now. Indy Group trying to stay with those two. A shadow right there waiting for some running room now as they make their way toward the top of the stretch. Stellar Jane is also right there. Ella Love on the outside. Storm Flag flying. It's five lengths from the lead. Nebraska Tornadoes dropped out of it. They're off the turn into the stretch. Tam Will digs down. Into the breach comes a shadow. And the shadow comes away with the lead. Storm Flag flying is in behind horses on the outside. It's Stellar Jane coming down to the finish. A shadow in front and trying to hold on. And at the wire, it is a shadow who wins by almost two lengths. Storm Flag flying came on to be second. Stellar Jane was third, and Tam Wheel was fourth. So they come from just off the pace. It was a flawless, flawless ride by Johnny Velasquez. And there's Texan Todd Pletcher. He has just won his first Breeders' Cup. That is right. Todd Pletcher had been 0 for 12 at the Breeders' Cup, but a shot under that very patient ride by John Velasquez. He waited, he waited, he waited. He had been saving ground along the inside. It parted for him as they came into the stretch, and when he said go, the three-year-old Philly took off to wrap up the three-year-old Philly championship. The fifth Breeders' Cup winning ride for John Velasquez, and number one for Todd Pletcher. Charlie, that was a very, very patient ride, I thought, by John Velasquez. Well, and she had learned to relax so nicely last time in the cotillion. It was a very easy race for her. She won it nicely. She was the top money winning filly. As a three year old, even more than the older filly, she's been very workmanlike all along, and it all came together for her today. Donna Brothers. Johnny, what a great year this filly's had, and you too. Unbelievable. She has some heart. She tries every time. I'm just glad that I was on her. She won the Kentucky Oaks this year and now wins the disc stuff. Uh, you can't win those kind of races here. You can't really run. I'll tell you what, she's a tough filly. She's old class, very good horse. Got to give her all the credit. Johnny, you and Todd Pletcher have both had a great year. You're both in front with money earned in both of your respective categories. But this is Todd Pletcher's first Breeders' Cup win. What are you going to say to Todd when you get back? I'll tell you what, I'm glad that I was the one on him for, for his first Breeders' Cup. Um, we've been together for so long now. I'm really glad that I, that I wasn't there. On the horse that he won, he first Breeders' Cup. All right, congratulations, Johnny. Tom, we got a little hairy there at the end, but I think <laughs> we're safe now. All right, Donna. A shadow heading back with the Breeders' Cup distaff in her pocket. And here's when she burst through that opening and to take the lead. John Velasquez making sure with a right hand whip. She's the 10th winning distaff favorite. She went off as the two to one favorite. A shot wraps up the three year old Philly championship as she crossed the finish line and for Texan Todd Pletcher finally breaking the Breeders Cup jinx in his home state. <laughs> he was giving it his best too. We'll be back. At Lone Star Park, Grand Prairie, Texas, where Ashado has become the seventh three year old filly to win the distaff in her first race against Older Mares. There she is. She now has won her placed in nine grade one stakes at nine different tracks, being led in to the winner's circle. Let's go to Bob Newmeyer. Jerry Bailey was born right near Dallas, and I know Storm Flag Flying, you would have loved to have her go out to the breeding farms as a winner. It seemed to me maybe you got into a little bit of a jam in mid-stretch. Was that in fact happened uh, at that point, Jerry? Well, it, was, it got a little tight, as it always does in these kind of races. 
but she made it through all right and had a, a fairly good kick. But the problem is on a come from behind horse, you, you need to run the far turn extremely fast so that when you turn into this short stretch, you're almost on even terms with the leaders. All right, that's you in the black and the cherry cap trying to find a seam there between horses. Yeah, and she the seam was there and it never closed up on her. But the problem was she couldn't make a run on the turn because of traffic. And it's tough on a come from behind horse on this track. All right, Jerry Bale will keep that in mind for pleasantly perfect in the classic. Back to you. And there is a shot being led into the winner's circle, and now John Velasquez dismounts. They set a track record in this race, the first of many, no doubt, because this is the first grade one race to be held at Lone Star, so expect a lot of track records to fall today. 148.26 as we check in with Kenny Rice. Thanks, Tom, and with Robbie Alvarado aboard Stellar Jane, who finishes third in this race. Robbie, you had a wide trip, and on a course that has tight turns and a short straight stretch, you said that's not necessarily a great place to be? No, not at all. Uh, she didn't get away as be best she could. Uh, I had to sacrifice some position to save ground around the first turn, particularly Philly. She don't like to go around the turns, but she got over them well here at Lone Star. We heard Jerry Bailey allude to it just a moment ago about the turns and about the stretch. How is this different from some of the other tracks? Well, uh, other race tracks, you have to, you can wait till you straight up down the stretch and before you make a run here, you got to start moving and get some kind of momentum at the half three eighths pole just to make it around those turns. And uh, there we see on the outside the gray number 11. That's you with Stellar Jane, who you've been out there all the way. Yeah, she's fine. I seen Johnny had a clean trip through the inside of it. Knew she was a tough filly all year and uh, she was the filly to beat. But I'm going to sit next to the wide trip. I had my feeling ran great. I'm proud of her. Okay, the rest of the way, when you ride again, do you look to try to bring it in a little closer if possible, save some ground? All right, Kuvi in the sprint. Uh, he's an awful quick horse. I'm sure I'll be fairly placed. All right, good luck to you. Thanks. Thank you, Robbie Alvarado, who finishes third here in the distaff aboard Stellar Jane, trained by Wayne Lucas. And, of course, Lucas opting to send Azari later on to the Classic today. Tom? All right, Kenny, as Machado goes back. Shadow will get a bath. And uh, the fans look at the tote board to see that his shadow paid $6, 360 and 280. Storm flag flying, her final race, finishing second, just nosing out Stellar Jane, $7, $4. Stellar Jane, 480 to show. That exacto worth $34.80. You see the other exotic payoffs. And they completed it in track record time, 148.26. Let's go to Mike Battaglia now for the official trophy presentation. Thanks, Tom. And Ashado locks up the three-year-old Philly championship. Uh, Jack Wolf, Todd Pletcher, John Velasquez, a great ride. And to make the presentation on behalf of Nextel, Vice President, National Account Sales, Leslie A. Baker. Leslie? Thank you. Congratulations. At Nextel, we pride ourselves on getting things done. And your performance today was a fine example of that. It's my pleasure and an honor to present Okay. Do we have Bill? I feel I feel fine, uh, but I'm just one of the owners. Uh, John's Martin and Paul Sale are the other two owners, and uh, I don't know where they are, but they've got to be somewhere around here. And uh, I just want to thank Todd and Johnny for the great job they've done, and of course Barry. He he buys all of our horses and breaks them, and so that's that's what makes it happen. Barry Berkelheimer on the end. Congratulations, guys. Todd, we had you isolated. I've seen you a lot, win a lot of races. That's about as excited as I've ever seen you get. Congratulations, your first Breeders' Cup win. Thank you. Yeah, that was a special one. And, uh, you know, you're always anxious to get that first one out of the way. And this Philly's, you know, been so good to us all along. And to win the Oaks and the Distaff in the same year, it's quite an accomplishment. Well, you did some Texas-type celebrating when she, when she was crossing the line. Yeah, you said you'd never see me that excited, but you never see me. Win. I never won a Breeders' Cup, so. Uh. And you were hollering, go, Johnny, go, Johnny, go, Johnny, and what a ride. John Velazquez, as usual, a flawless ride. And this filly's just hickory. She's never been off the board. This was a huge effort today. She just has some heart. I mean, she's a really good horse. I really have to thank, uh, thank Todd and the owners for giving me the opportunity and giving me all the trust that, that, that I really need to go out there and, and perform my best and to give it the best I can do to, uh, with the horses. Uh, I, I just got to give it the credit to the horse. I mean, she did everything I wanted to. I wanted to do it. Uh, after that, uh, I was just looking for some room to get it running. So she, she was great. Well, you guys did a great job. You've got more to do here this afternoon also. And who's this, uh, by the way, Johnny? This is my daughter, Lorena. Hi, Lorena. Hi. <laughs> so, hi to Mike. You proud of your daddy? Yes. Yes. Very proud? Yes. Yes. All right, Lorena. So. A great win by Ashado, Ashado, the three-year-old Philly champion. She wins the distaff, Tom. 
All right, Mike, and here's the official order of finish in the distaff. A shadow storm flag flying in Stellar Jane. Tam Wheel, the early pace setter, faded to fourth. And you see the rest of the horses as they finished in the distaff, the first Breeders' Cup race of the day. Of course, the horse missing from that list is Azari, champion and horse of the year. Her owner, Michael Paulson, trainer Wayne Lucas, selected to run her against males in the Classic, passing the distaff where she would have been the overwhelming favorite. And there is a look at Azari earlier today. And uh, the big question, of course, is why to pass the distaff and run in the Classic? The answer is a complex one, but it has a lot to do with relationships, human to equine and human to human. It was amazing to be around her every day. I look forward to seeing her because she made my heart sing. I understand just how fortunate I was, very deeply. It's a humbling game. It's a very humbling game. I always tell my assistants, humility is only one race away. But the good ones have a way of picking you up. I was very close to my father. He and I always had a very close relationship. And I'm sure my father would be just uh, elated with the Zeri success. Is that your favorite? Is that your favorite? It's like my uh, father lives on through his horses that he bred. When Azari started out, she was a little on the, the light, thin side, so I didn't train her hard because I wanted her to develop and get stronger. Every time she went into the gate, I would think to myself, oh, have I done enough? They're off! And Azari takes charge. In 2002, Laura Desaru guided Azari through an undefeated season, superstar Azari. culminating with a Breeders' Cup win in the distaff at Arlington Park. Distaff champion, Azari, who wins by four and a half lengths today. 2002 was a total dream year, which resulted in horse of the year. In a routine check of her legs, I noticed some inflammation. So we stopped on her immediately because it was the only thing to do. We've had this horse checked out by all the top vets, and uh, th there was never any tendon injury. A dispute between Paulson and Desaru, and that was it. Azari was gone, taken from Desaru, and given to a trainer with a record of success with Phillies. Michael Paulson's motivation is unmistakable. Azari runs, and his father's spirit lives on. Azari, Azari is back in a big way. Azari has won the gold. Wish I had five like that. I don't know that I've been around not only a Billy or Mare, but a racehorse is as clean and sound as this one. It's like we picked up Peyton Manning in the free agency. <laughs> D. Wayne Lucas has been training thoroughbreds for over a quarter of a century now, and stepping out of the box is nothing new for him. Entering Azari in the Classic has been criticized by some, but for those closest, Azari inspires confidence. You gonna win on Saturday? Yes, yes you are. Yes you are. This horse has unbelievable heart and determination. My dad was one that took challenges and uh, that's just uh, part of life, it's part of the sport. You gotta take, uh, take the challenge. I watched all her races, I, I wouldn't miss it. I'm her greatest fan and, and I'll remain so. She's already great. What she is trying to do is she's trying to get into that real thin air way up there where nobody else has been. And if she does that, then we really got something special. And there is Azari back in her stall. She'll be coming over for the Classic, the final race of the day. A controversial decision. She would have been uh, less than even money to win the distaff. Instead, she's going in the Classic as a long shot. And uh, it was, as we said, a very controversial decision. She could make them all look good, though, if she runs well in the Classic later today. From Lone Star Park, Grand Prairie, Texas, we're underway at the Breeders' Cup. We'll be back after this message from your local NBC station. 
MetLife is providing today's aerial coverage of the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships. The MetLife blimps Snoopy 1 and Snoopy 2 typically cruise at a speed of 35 miles an hour, about 1,200 feet. Look to the skies for the MetLife blimps as they team up with NBC later this year. Next Breeders' Cup race is the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies for two-year-old Phillies, and here are the current odds. Boletto at 9-2, to two, higher world 42 in the gold scratched. Runway model 13-1. Culinary is 5 to 1, Dance Away Capote 11, Sis City at 19 to 1, Mona Lisa 18, Sense of Style 4 to 1, Sweet Catamine the 2 to 1 favorite, Culture Clash a real long shot, Sharp Lisa 11 to 1, and Play with Fire is 26 to 1. And we mentioned Boleto, of course, the Maktoum family of Dubai has made so many inroads into racing all over the world, and Boleto is the first Breeders' Cup starter, the first grade one winner ever bred in United Arab Emirates. And she'll be ridden today by Jerry Bailey. Jerry Bailey, the Texan, coming back from an injury, a broken wrist. And earlier today, he talked with Bob Costas. Jerry, you're the winningest jockey in Breeders' Cup history with 14 victories. What does this day mean to you? Well, it's the star attraction of our sport. It's the day that you want to shine and hope you're on horses that can shine. You're laboring with a bit of an injury. You broke a wrist installing storm windows, as so many people that lived in Florida had to do in anticipation of the hurricanes. What's your condition right now? I've been back for a little over two weeks now. I, I felt good the entire time I've been back. I'm pain-free, so I should be all right. But during that time, you lost the mount on Kitten's Joy, a freakishly good three-year-old colt who'll be running in the Turf Classic. That may hurt worse than the wrist, losing that mount. Yeah, it, it already does. But, you know, Ken Ramsey, the owner, decided to go with Johnny, and that's, it's his horse, it's his decision, and there's not a whole lot I can do about it. There's been speculation about your future at age 47. What do you see the next couple of years holding for you? I really don't know. I'm, since I got hurt, I had some time to reflect. But really, the first thing I thought about was trying to come back for this day and making it in, into good shape. Uh, I'll, I'll ride today. I'll do the best I can. And I'll have plenty of time to think about it in the next two months. Is it possible, then, that this could be a swan song for you? It's possible. Uh, I had said for the last few years, I'll take it a year at a time. And, and, uh, and that's what I'm doing. And if this should be it, when so be it. Jerry, good luck today. OK, thanks. Jerry Bailey. All right, Bob, and there is uh, Boletto, Jerry Bailey's mount, winner of the Frisette Stakes at Belmont Park in the colors of the Darley Stable. Let's go to Kenny Rice. Thanks, Tom. Most people would not get excited about a maiden coming in to the Breeders' Cup. No maiden has ever won any Breeders' Cup race, but then the maiden is trained here by Aiden O'Brien, one of the top trainers in all the world who's just had a terrific run. He trains Mona Lisa. Now, Mona Lisa, he told me earlier, should be a group one winner as far as he's concerned. She lost by less than two lengths in a group run race, and that was simply because that she got caught in traffic. She's also sired by Giants Causeway, who was runner up in the 2000 Classic. So O'Brien feels that he has a filly here who has the talent and has the breeding that can do well in her first attempt on the dirt, yet she has not won a race, but people are taking a closer look now at Mona Lisa simply because of the connections of Aiden O'Brien, who has burst onto the scene in the Breeders' Cup in 1998. He hasn't been competing here that long, but he ranks among the top 10 in trainers with the almost $5 million in purse money won during a brief try here at the Breeders' Cup. So he feels very confident that Mona Lisa will make a good case for herself today. Now let's go to Tom. All right, Kenny, we're looking at Mona Lisa there, Jamie Spencer in the saddle. Let's go to Bob Newmeyer. I'm with uh, the irrepressible Julio Canani from the West Coast who has the cowboy hat, the native of Peru with a favorite sweet cat of mine. I know in an every day at Del Mar, Santa Anita, you love most of your horses. So I only assume, Julio, that you have sweet cat of mine as the two to one favorite, that you doubly love her in this spot, no? Well, she's a nice filly, and uh, I think everybody likes her, though, but uh, she's got a lot of talent, and she's very special. You're concerned about the short stretch here. We saw that in the first race, that perhaps you need to get into the race, and this filly likes to come from way back. Well, this is, this is out of my hands, and whatever it will be, will be, but if I'm going to be thinking on that, I got problems. Julio, thank you. You're welcome. Julio Canani. Now let's check in with Mike Battaglia. Thanks, Tom. And Rafael Bejarano rides the four horse in here, runway model, and he's unknown to most people around America, but I want to tell you, this kid can ride. He came to the U.S. from Peru less than two years ago, and right now, he leads the nation and wins. He's won over 400 races. He's the first jockey in history to win riding titles at the four tracks in Kentucky in the same year, and the recently concluded Keeneland meet, he just was awesome. He beat Pat Day, 26 wins in that three-week uh, race meet, including six 
stakes races. One of them was aboard a runway model in the Alcibiades. So he is an unknown right now, but the kid can ride, and I believe he's going to be an up-and-coming star. Watch for Rafael Bejarano. We'll watch him today, Mike. In fact, uh, from Peru and schooled by the elderly gentleman there that brought Edgar Prado and Jose Santos to the United States to be two of the select riders in this country. And the horse is uh, making their appearance on the track. And, uh, Chelsea, this is always an adventure for two-year-old fillies because they're so inexperienced. And today they're going to see something new, these stands all the way around the track. Well, they are, Tom. The crowd is, is on the front side, the, the turns, and the back side. But most of these fillies have been here all week and have at least seen a lot of commotion around the back side. And I'll tell you what, this is a very steady group of two-year-old fillies. They've won 23 of their collective 47 starts. That is about a 50% batting average there. They're always more precocious than the, as the, uh, more precocious than the Colts at this point. So, and generally people seem to think they might even be a better group than the Colts right now. And one other Lisa we've got in here who's one to look at is Sharp Lisa, who was a good second to runway model uh, in the Alcibiades. She was closing fast, and she has a very interesting rider change. Frankie Dettori, the, the champion uh, European jockey, is going to be aboard her, and that's a little unusual to see him riding a two-year-old here on the dirt in America. Here's a look at Sharp Lisa, and here's the post parade for the juvenile fillies. Number one, Boleto in the Sheikh Mohammed's Darley Stable colors. Winner of the Frisette. You'll like this mile and a 16th distance. Jerry Bailey is her fifth different rider. Number two, Higher World, trained in Canada by Mark Cassie. $22,000 Keeneland yearling purchase unbeaten in three starts, all coming at Woodbine in the Toronto suburbs. Number three, In the Gold, was scratched. Number four, runway model, the Alcibiades winner, 17 to 1, and a tonic for 64-year-old trainer Bernie Flint, who spent five days in intensive care at a Louisville hospital in September with a blood clot in his lung. And this is the mount for young Rafael Bejarano, his first Breeders' Cup ride. Number five, culinary, breeder Guy Snowden has an honorary degree from Johnson and Wales University, a culinary institute, hence the name. Jack Smith paid 25,000 for in May, and she's unbeaten in two stars, including the Arlington Washington Lassie six weeks ago. Number six, Dance Away Capote, fourth in the Alcibiades with a troubled trip from the outside post and the first Breeders' Cup for her trainer, Graham Motion. Number seven, Sis City. One of this Phillies owners is Joe Torrey, who hopes for better results today than he cut from his Yankees. She has a couple of wins and five starts. She was third to Boleto in the Frisette at Belmont. Number eight is Mona Lisa, a maiden. She's never won a race. Trained in Ireland by Aidan O'Brien, as we were discussing earlier. Fourth against winners in a Group 1 race in Ireland, but a maiden has never won a Breeders' Cup race, as Kenny Rice told you a few moments ago. Number nine, Sense of Style, the most expensive yearling in the field, $800,000, but she's already paid dividends with wins in the Spinaway and the Matron, but then she was trapped inside in the Alcibiades at Keeneland, finishing fifth as the three to five favorite, hoping for a better trip today. Number 10 is the favorite, that sweet cattle mine, bred and owned by Mr. and Mrs. Marty Wygod, trained by Julio Canani. She won the grade one Del Mar debutante as a maiden, then came back to romp by four links in the oak leaf. The 11 horses, Culture Clash, and this is the first Breeders' Cup mount for her jockey, Kerwin John. He was born in the Virgin Islands. It's the Phillies' third start. She was fourth in the oak leaf. Number 12 is Sharp Lisa. Purchased by Paul Redham after she won a maiden race at Calder, then beaten ahead by runway model in the Alcibiades. And Frankie DeTore, as Chelsea said, friendly with the owner, gets the ride coming in from Europe and riding this U.S. Philly. And number 13 is Play With Fire. Owner Gary Swirling was a Goldman Sachs group partner, but he missed a chance for some immediate return when he was away on business. And this Philly won at Saratoga at 48 to 1. He didn't have a bet down. She's been third in the spinaway in the matron and fourth in the present. And that is the field for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. So let's go down now to Mike and Bob and see who they like in this wide open race. Well, the juveniles are always fun. Two-year-olds, the Colts and the Phillies. Right. This is the distaff uh, Philly version. 
I think Sweet Catamine Mike deserves to be the favorite off her big win at Santa Anita in the Oak Leaf State. She's two to one on the board, but she draws the 10 post. And again, she likes to come from way off the pace. And it's although it's early to say this is a speed favoring track that might be a tough trip for her today. Well, you know, I definitely think she's the one to beat. I was on the fence. I was either going to take her or Sense of Style. I went for Sense of Style. Now, Sense of Style is a, there's a shot of her. Uh, she's three wins and four career starts. And quite honestly, her last trip in the Alcibiades was horrible. And it was a race that Patrick B. and Cohn and company weren't really shooting for. They were shooting for this Breeders' Cup race all along. I think she'll get a good trip. I think the fact that uh, B. and Cohn adds Lasix today really, really impresses me. He's 47%, Bob, first time Lasix users. He puts Lasix in her for the first time. I think it's going to help. I think she gets the stalking trip. And I'm going to take her, give her a slight edge over Sweet Catamite. Well, I like odds. And 6 to 1 on culinary is very uh, enticing to me. She's a filly that obviously was meant to be a distance horse because her maiden at Arlington was at a mile and in this the Arlington Washington Lassie also at a mile and you see how well she's finishing and drawing away in fact Mike this time was faster than the Colts ran in the same division that day and plus I love to eat how can I resist culinary at six to one yeah I think juvenile Phillies I think she has an excellent chance but we both think sweet cat of mine is probably the one to beat we're just gonna try to beat her in here all right, guys, uh, let's see how the cyber cappers feel about the juvenile fillies. Mike mentioning uh, Lasix, which is the anti-bleeding medication uh, for pulmonary bleeding. Dance Away Capote drawing 17%. Culture Clash and Sharp Lisa, they're going for some long shots. Sense of Style and Culinary are our handicappers' picks. The juvenile fillies, they're on the track warming up. Back to the World Thoroughbred Championships in a moment. Juvenile Phillies are making their way toward the starting gate. You'll see the current odds at the bottom of your screen as they trek toward the starting gate for this mile and a 16th million dollar race. And uh, Donna Brothers on horseback on the track. Some special uh, loading instructions this time for Mona Lisa. Is that correct? Tom, that is correct. Mona Lisa, of course, a European filly. She brought her own blanket. It's one of those Monty Roberts blankets. Just, just gives a horse a sense of security when they're standing in the starting gate. Very thick blanket. She looks like she's kind of a filly in her own world. She hasn't gone with the pony, but she stayed very relaxed. And right now they have her up at the gate in preparation to put the blanket on her. The starter said she schooled with it and was great, and they don't expect any problems from her. So I'm just uh, putting the blanket on there. There she is. It's just sort of a, who is it, Linus that has the blanket? It's just sort of a uh, <laughs> security <laughs> issue. And uh, Donna mentioned Monty Roberts, the man who has become famous as sort of a horse whisperer. He breaks yearlings in 20 seconds to saddle, or 20 seconds, 20 minutes to saddle, and has become famous for his uh, making horses feel secure. As they begin to load into the gate, Mona Lisa, by the way, an expensive yearling at Tattersalls in England. And we saw Sweet Catamine still as the two to one favorite and 50% winning favorites in this race. 10 of the first 20 winning favorites in the juvenile fillies. And there's Sweet Catamine. You see what a big, strong filly she is. And she'll only get better the further she goes. But you know, Tom, no filly has ever won the juvenile without at least three prior starts, so that affects uh, certainly horses like Culinary Sharp Lisa. Yeah, come back away from her. Loading in for the million dollar juvenile fillies over a mile and a 16th. And Sharp Lisa, a little reluctant to go in. There's a look at Sis City. And for the call of the race, let's go once again to Tom Durkin. Play with fire, the last of 12 to move into the starting gate, ready for the start for the juvenile fillies. <laughs> And they're off. A very slow beginning there for Mona Lisa and her stablemate, Sense of Style. But it's Sis City who's racing for the lead, along with the Canadian filly, Higher World, and those two will vie for the early lead. Just in behind them, Culinary now runs third on the outside. Boletto, a good spot with her inside post. She runs along in fourth. Sharp Lisa is now fifth. Runaway model has found her way to the inside, C6. And Sweet Catamine, the favorite, is seventh and in between horses. Then it's a break of two and a half lengths back to Sense of Style, who's trying to get back in it after that slow beginning. Just to her inside, it's Dance Away Compote, then play with fire toward the outside. Mona Lisa, the Irish maiden, at the back of the pack with long shot culture class. Down the back stretch. 
entire world and Sis City going at it head to head. The quarter went in 22 and four fifth seconds. The half in 46 and two over this glib track today. So they race for the far turn. Higher world continues to bandy here with Sis City. And Boleto has been maneuvered to the outside for a clear shot at them beneath Jerry Bailey. Boleto's now being asked to pick it up. She's still a length behind. Runway model continues down toward the inside. Culinary right there fighting on. Oh, and sweet Katamine had a check, and it cost her daily. She checked in traffic. In the meantime, Sharp Lisa had a clear run coming toward the leaders on the far outside. And now the field turns for home. And it is Sis City who turns for home with a tenuous lead. Boletto's right there. Sweet Katamine now is running room. And here comes the big filly on the outside. Runway model bottled up toward the rail. And unquestionably, the two-year-old Philly champion. She wins by five. Boletto was second, and Runway Model was third. Well, that's a champion if I ever saw one. She's a big Philly, and she's got a big future. She was stopped cold on the far turn, but like a true champion, it didn't bother her a bit. <laughs> and you had the shot there, Tom, of her sort of have her tongue hanging out. She stuck out her tongue at the, all the rest of them. They all gave her the best shot. She uh, had a little traffic problems, didn't make any difference. She just proved herself to be much the best. Sweet cattle mine with Julio Canani in his third of ten in Breeders' Cup action, his third victory. And for Corey Nakatani, the winning rider, his sixth Breeders' Cup win. Thank you, Lord. And you always think of Julio Canani really with the older horses because he's won the mile twice with older grass horses. And here he is with this really exceptional two year old filly. She had been so visually impressive out in California. But look at the size of her for her to get stopped like that and to get moving again. And then one is she pleased with her ears pricked just looking around. This is really a true star. And there's Dono with Corey, Corey congratulations. Nakatani. Thanks, hon. Looks like she had to overcome a tough trip. Well, yeah, you know, I was sitting there. Tracking Boletto was a very nice filly, and uh, I was sitting there biding my time. I didn't really want to move too soon, but I know how good she is, so I was just sitting there painting, being patient, and uh, it opened up. Jerry was able to go on, and it, I was in a little tight, though, and she just overcome that. Corey, I couldn't see the race very well from my vantage point, but Tom Durkin said she checked sharply at the 3 8 pole. Did it feel like that, or did you just have to wait? It wasn't the three eighths pole, it was the quarter pole, actually. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, but um, she had a tough trip at that point, but uh, up to that point, it was a great trip. Big field, anything can happen, and my main thing is, you know, riding for Julio, just <laughs> giving her a chance to win, and, and she's such a nice filly in the Y gods. What more can you say? I want to say hi to Matthew, Brittany, and Austin, they're back home. All right, Corey, congratulations, Tom. Awfully nice filly to overcome that kind of trouble. And here's what we've been talking about, the time that uh, Sweet Cattle Mine had to check number 10 in the light blue silks. Right here, Corey Nakatani has to sort of take a hold of her right there just to prevent her from coming up on the heels of another and being squeezed in there. And Nakatani still is in some pretty good traffic. And for a two year old filly, inexperienced, and for one as big as she is, to stop and start like this is very unusual. She squeezed a little bit there and now finds clear running. And once she gets clear, gets to driving on the outside, she just mows them down. But that was a pretty impressive showing for this big filly, like half bridal to one last year, uh, rem reminiscent of uh, her in size. Cora Nakatani barely gives her a little tap of the whip. He never even turned it over until he got clear of the field. And then he said, well, I better ride her out a little bit. Ready Kentucky by the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Marty Wygod, a two-year-old filly by Stormcat out of Sweet Life by Chris S. Sweet Catamine wins the juvenile fillies. Sweet Catamine, winner of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Fillies with jockey Corey Nakatani up. Paying $6.64, $3. Boletto second, $4.83.40. Runway model, $5. The Exacta, $29. As you see, the other trifecta and superfecta payoffs as well. Second fastest Breeders' Cup Juvenile Fillies. And as Sweet Catamine takes her bow, let's go to Kenny Rice with Jerry Bailey, who finished second in his second consecutive race. Thank you, Tom. Jerry was in on it, taking a good look at some of the action, especially at the 3 8 pole coming around that turn. Now, you're on uh, Boletto. Did you get a good look at what happened, Jerry? I got a good look at somebody's head. They ran up in there right inside me, trying to split myself and Johnny on the lead. There just wasn't any room, and whoever it was took the worst of it. 
And then it happened again in the middle of the stretch, uh, probably another horse, uh, but there simply wasn't room. Let's take a look at it here. Uh, Boletto in the, well, maroon silks there. You're a number one, and can you pick up any of it right here as we see Nakatani going? That's it, you know, when you try and take your chances in races like this, sometimes it stays open, sometimes it doesn't. And for him, it didn't that time. Well, some poise shown by your young filly, though, out there, and what got a crowded situation as well as the Winter Sweet Catamount. You know, it's kind of like going from a student driver to New York City for these two year old fillies, but she handled it well. All right, thank you, Jerry. Jerry Bailey, as Tom Hammond said, two races, two seconds. Let's go now to Trevor Denman. Oh. Fortunately, Sweet Catamine came through and stopped any controversy. There wasn't really a bumper car race, but there were three incidents. One of them at the start. The other one, obviously, we saw where Sweet Catamine had a take-up coming to the quarter pole, and then that incident at the eighth pole. So it was a fairly eventful race. Let's go down and take a look at the start here. You can see those Sweet Catamine extreme outside. Watch this horse right here. That is number nine, Sense of Style. See a leap in the air there. Not a good start at all. Now, as things turned out, it probably didn't mean that much because she was well beaten in here, and no one was going to beat Sweet Catamine. But it was interesting to see if this had been an even run race and she had been beaten by a length or less, then that start definitely would have cost her. You could see her just go up in the air and not get a good start. Now we start turning for home. Here's the winner, Sweet Catamine in the white cap, going to swing to the outside. Cory Nakatani gets a dream run through. Watch to her inside, though. You'll see number seven, Sis City, on the inside shift out just a little. And you can see Belito is in tight and having to check in just behind Belito there take up to run back into fourth was runaway mo runway model who did come back on to finish third but sweet catamine just destroyed them belito overcame a little trouble and then the horse who really had trouble was runway model very creditable third for her she wouldn't have won it but she probably would have been second tom all right trevor sweet catamine heading back to the barn having won the breeders cup juvenile fillies now let's go to mike pataglia for the trophy presentation Definitely an impressive win for Sweet Catamine. Her owners, Mr. and Mrs. Marty Wygod, Julio Canani, the trainer, and a great ride by Corey Nakatani to make the presentation on behalf of Guinness, the director of Guinness, Chris Parsons. Uh, that was an absolutely fantastic performance, absolutely brilliant. Uh, congratulations, wonderful. It's great for Guinness to be here as a part of the Breeders' Cup and the NTRA sponsors. Uh, very proud of it. I'm very proud to hand this over to you right now. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you very much. And Marty, how's it feel winning this Breeders' Cup race? That was a huge effort by your filly. It doesn't feel any better. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Congratulations. Thank you. Julio, you really had this horse in top form today. She's what, three straight stakes wins for her, and she just keeps getting better every single time. She's very special now. <laughs> That's all, yeah? <laughs> Nothing else. Very special. She can make any training feel good. <laughs> Corey, you, you had some trouble. We've already documented the trouble you had, but uh, it really didn't seem to bother this filly at all. A lot of times with a two-year-old filly, if you have to check like that, it can really affect them. Well, Julio made my job easy, and obviously, sweet catamaran, what more can I say? She's just a champion, and I just sitting there, like you said, there was trouble. Um, I was sitting there uh, tracking Boletto, and I knew she's a pretty nice filly, so I was in the right spot, but it just happened to be where Bailey come over just a little bit. I mean, I was inside of him saving ground, so I just was uh, in, a, in a tight spot, and she, I was able to get out of there without really having to stop her a lot, and uh, when I moved her outside and just set her down, I knew I had the race won, and it was just a matter of how far she was going to win by. Were you surprised that she took off that quick? I mean, she just drew off from this field. I wasn't surprised at all. Her last race was a very indication when I got back. I told Mr. Why God, we got something real special here. And looking forward to riding her in the next race and uh, looking forward to winning the Breeders' Cup for him. And uh, then I got to the, to the talking to him after the race. I said, you know what? This is a Kentucky Oaks filly, and let's see what happens. Thank you, Corey. Julio, good job shaking his head. But she could be really something special. Sweet cat of mine, Tom. And uh, Corey Nakatani celebrating as he crosses the finish line and gives Sweet Catamine a little pat between the ears as she uh, sticks out her tongue at the other juvenile fillies to win impressively and wrap up this championship. Here's the official uh, complete order of finish. Sweet Catamine, Boletto, and Runway Model. One, two, three, Sis City, Dance Away, Capote, Sharply, Seculinary. And completing the field, Flay of Aspire, Sense of Style, Culture Clash, Mona Lisa, and Higher World was 12th and last. Well, uh, this could be a big day for all the folks wearing red. That's the uh, family of Ken Ramsey, including his wife, Sarah. Catherine is what uh, she is known by by all those who know her. And they've got the buttons on because they have three entries today, and all three have a chance to win. Their first chance will come in the next race, the NetJets Breeders' Cup Mile. And here are the current odds for the 
Breeders Cup Net Jets Mile. Whipper at eight to one, Silver Tree twelve, Special Ring at nine to two. That's Julio Canani. As we lost the odds there. Julio Canani, who just saddled Sweet Catamine. Diamond Green at 20, Musical Chimes, the Philly 15 to 1, Singletary 15, Six Perfections, Defending Champion 5 to 1, Nothing to Lose at 7 to 2, Black Dune 20 to 1, and Mr. O'Brien is 8 to 1. That's the Net Jets Mile, which is up next. But first, let's go back to New York now for the NBC Sports Update. Let's go to our New York studios and join Dan Hicks. It's the 21st Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships on NBC, coming to you from the state of Texas for the first time, Lone Star Park in Grand Prairie, Texas. Up next, the Net Jets Mile. Here are the current odds. Whipper 6-1, to one, Silver Tree 21, Special Ring at 9-1. to one. Soaring Free 11, Domestic Dispute 38 to 1. The favorite, the three year old Artie Schiller at 5 to 2. Antonio Pius, Antonius Pius 29 to 1. Diamond Green 19, Musical Chimes the Philly at 20. Singletary 14, Six Perfections 7 to 1. Nothing to Lose 6 to 1. Black Dune is 8 to 1. And Mr. O'Brien is a 20 to 1 shot. And uh, there's a look at Bobby Frankel and Ken Ramsey on the right of your screen with the 12 horse nothing to lose the first of three that Ken Ramsey will be running today and as this Breeders Cup day unfolds it'll be impossible to ignore Ken Ramsey the self styled king of the pick six now not just a better but a horse owner rubbing elbows with the social elite quite a trip for a man born in Artemis Kentucky population 500. I guess if there would be one word to describe Ken, it would be, he's a gambler. And they're off. And here he comes up. Oh, and he's got plenty of run. Oh, my. He's a gambler not only at the windows, but uh, more so, he's been a gambler in business over the years. A real risk taker. Ever know that guy who's always investing in some crazy idea? The guy who's always trying to strike it rich? Well, meet Ken Ramsey, except he's the dreamer who's made it all come true. Well, I'm always looking for an opportunity because I'm basically an entrepreneur. And timing is what it's all about. And when you see something, you have to jump at it, seize the opportunity, and, and not be afraid to fail. This is my office. This is the command center where we uh, dispatch all the, the instructions out to... I, I, I'm the fellow that, that manages the managers. So we run our cellular telephone business from here. We run our radio business from here. Uh, we claim horses from here, we buy horses from here, we uh, decide who's going to run in what races from here. I mean, this is the command center. Basically, it's what it is. Being in command is important to Ken Ramsey. He started his career in trucking, <laughs> then tried his hand at real estate. But one day, something came in the mail that would change his life forever. I've taken this magazine called the Kiplinger Newsletter, and I read an article in there about Sager Telephones. And I thought, gee, this is a better mousetrap. So we set out trying to figure out how we could get a franchise to operate one of those. He had the foresight. He, he could see what was going to happen. He could see that eight out of 10 people 15, 20 years down the line, like today, are have a cell phone in their ear. OK, talk to you later. Thanks for calling, George. A uh, man that doesn't plan is a man that's planning to fail. So uh, I never quit. It's the bulldog determination. It's just inbred in me. I've been that way all my life. Uh, in other words, I always say, if at first you don't succeed, you're just about average. <laughs> There's nothing average about Ramsey, especially when it comes to his horses. Today, he has three entries, including two favorites. For a guy who's made his living against all odds, he seems perfectly comfortable being the favorite. Well, let's go out and see what some of the smart people think. These horses now are sort of like a dream come true. It's like what you've worked for all your life, and all of a sudden the pieces begin to fall into place. If we don't win a single race out there, I'm going to have Texas size fun. <laughs> Roses in May. <laughs> he is the kind of genuine character that you find in the thoroughbred racing. Bobby Frankel, his trainer there on the left of your screen, and Ken Ramsey in the center. He made so much money uh, in the 
cellular phone franchise business that he bought himself a horse farm and has plenty of horses now. But he had a farm that he mortgaged at the time just to be eligible to enter the lottery for cellular franchises. They were down to the last one. They'd all been awarded but one. And the night before, he dreamt that he had won it. And he won it sitting in a certain seat. So the next morning, he got up early. He made sure he sat in the seat that had been in his dream. And sure enough, he won the last cellular franchise and took off from there. When before uh, there was off-track betting, before there was uh, simulcasting, he used to get in the car and drive two hours to go bet the pick six. He was king of the pick six. He hit a lot of them, a good handicapper, and now a major horse owner with three good horses in the Breeders' Cup today. In fact, one time at Churchill Downs, when one of his horses won a race, it was a muddy day, wet. He rolled up his pant legs, took off his shoes, and walked into the winner's circle with his horse barefoot. True story. Let's go to Mike Battaglia. Thanks, Tom. And you're taking a live shot look at Nothing to Lose. And take a look at the blinkers on there. Uh, Bobby Frankel told me that, you're not even going to believe this, Bobby Frankel, the leading trainer in the country, that two races back, he forgot he wanted to take the blinkers off of this horse. He just forgot. So he had to run with blinkers. He cut them way back. Two races in a row, he's won. Won very impressively with those makeshift blinkers. Uh, you really more call them a hood than blinkers. And he's won two races in a row since then. Runs in those same blinkers here this afternoon. He's going to be flying from off the pace. So uh, definitely one of them to beat here in a wide open mile. And let's send it over now to Bob Newmeyer. Well, there are some interested spectators in the results of this horse, Singletary. He's named after former ferocious bear middle linebacker Mike Singletary, now a coach with the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are on a train right now, riding to Philadelphia to tackle the Eagles on Sunday. And Mike Singletary knows very much about this horse. In fact, kidding Deion Sanders prime time that Sanders has no such horse named after him, Singletary's an interesting long shot in this race. And should he pull it off, maybe that'll be an omen that the Baltimore Ravens could uh, beat the previously unbeaten Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday. They're watching on the train as we speak. Kenny? Thanks, Bob. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And the Niarcos family, they have played a big part in the mile over the years, winning it five times, family and their connections. They had the defending champion, Six Perfections, who was bred in France and stayed with the Niarcos family's racing stable, Flaxman Holding. But they let one get away, and this is one to watch today. A little colt named Whipper, who was bred in Kentucky by Flaxman Holding and sold for a mere $4,000. He's gone on to win over $716,000 in a first or second place finish today. He'll become a millionaire. Plus, he's already a multiple grade one winner. Among those that he's beaten this year, just a couple of months ago in France, was six perfections. So the Niarcos family, they have a champ, but they let a good one go, a $4,000 horse who's running for big stakes today, Tom. Well, Kenny, there's a look at Whipper as uh, Christophe Soumillon gets a leg up, and there is a look at the defending champion, Six Perfections. Jerry Beta will be riding Six Perfections, trying to win the mile for the second consecutive year. The horses will make their way to the track when we return to Lone Star Park, deep in the heart of Texas. Welcome back to the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships from Lone Star Park, Grand Prairie, Texas. Jam-packed today for this racing action. Breeders' Cup Day. And next up will be the Jet Net Jets Breeders' Cup Mile. And there's a look at number one, Whipper. Kenny Rice was talking about a moment ago, coming over from Europe. And Whipper is the one horse. He's a three-year-old. Bred by Flaxman Holdings. That's the Niarcos family that owns six perfections in this race. And they sold him for a weanling as a weanling for only four thousand dollars number two silver tree bred and owned by peter vegso publisher of the chicken soup for the soul series of books winner of the bernard baruch at saratoga for bill mott whose last breeders cup winner was 1998. number three special ring seven-year-old gelding who was eighth in the mile last year and has raced but once since that was a wire-to-wire -wire win in the eddie reed in july julio canani already has a breeders cup win today under his belt with sweet catamine Number four, Soaring Free, has speed and led this race into the stretch last year before fading to fifth, based in Canada, where he won the Addo Mile, unbeaten in six turf starts this year. Number five is Domestic Dispute, the Stroop Stakes in February, his only win this year. He was fourth in his only race on turf, the Oak Tree Derby, last year. 
Number six is Artie Schiller, a three-year-old who is the first Breeders' Cup horse trained by Jimmy Jerkins, son of Hall of Famer Alan Jerkins, who's also here today. He's won five of six and two in a row, set the mile and an eighth course record at Beaumont, winning the Jamaica Handicap. Number seven, Antonius Pius, a $1.5 million yearling who's named for a Roman emperor who began his rule in 138 A.D. Irish trained three-year-old, winless in seven starts this year. Number eight is Diamond Green, another European-based three-year-old who has not won a race this year, 0 for 6, though he has been second four times, all at a distance of a mile. Let's look at Diamond Green. And number nine is Musical Chimes. There she is, the filly who was a classic winner in France last year. Now a four-year-old filly who takes on the boys. She just beat them in her last race, the Oak Tree Mile, for trainer Neil Drysdale. Number 10 is Singletary, beaten favorite in that Oak Tree Mile. His first start in four months, just beaten two noses. As uh, Mike, or as Bob Newmeyer was saying, named for Mike Singletary, wearing silks that look like the Chicago Bears colors. Owner Billy Koch was a big Bears fan while playing baseball at Northwestern University. Number 11, Six Perfections, four-year-old Philly, trying to become the fourth two-time winner of the mile. Jerry Bailey back aboard, first or second in 12 of 13 starts but winless this year in three outings. Number 12, nothing to lose. One of Ken and Sarah Ramsey's three top contenders today. Nothing to lose has a full brother. Everything to gain. This Colt, six for 11 on grass, never beaten more than two and three quarter lengths. Number 13 is Black Dune, French bred three-year-old who makes his first start against older horses. Julio Canani is the trainer. He also uh, trained Special Ring in this race. He won with Sweet Catamine, and he won the mile twice with Silic and Val Royal. And completing the field is number 14, Mr. O'Brien. The owners put up $135,000 to make this gelding a supplemental entry. The first Breeders' Cup horse for Robin Graham trying to become the third female trainer to win a Breeders' Cup race. Mr. O'Brien, four of five lifetime at a mile on the grass. So there is your field for the NetJets mile. Let's see who Bob and Mike like. Well, thanks, Tom. And uh, you know what? There's two races on Breeders' Cup Day that you really have to have a good trip to win, and they both have a history of having a lot of trouble, and that's the mile and the sprint. Today in the mile, Bob, I really don't think a horse is good enough to overcome a bad trip and win this race. Well, 14 horses at a mile is like rush hour in Los Angeles or New York at about 5 o'clock on a Monday through Friday, and I think luck could win this race. There'll be a cavalry charge of horses flying down the lane. Whipper fascinates me, I must say. I love the story about that he was bought for $4,000. He's a son of the sire, Miesk's son, who was out of Miesk. Remember her? She won this in back-to-back -back seasons, what a champion Miesk was. But she beat six perfections in Europe, Mike, which caught my eye. Six perfections won that right. race uh, last year, is in the field this year. He's going to need luck, but he's on the hedge. And I always like horses on the turf on that hedge. It's a matter of whether they get through or not, but I like them at a square price. I don't blame you for taking the rail. My horse is breaking from the 12 hole, and that's not going to be an easy task for nothing to lose. Talked about the blinkers and how he's run so well. This is him winning the Shadwell at uh, Keeneland. He did this impressively against a top flight field. Just drew off and won very easily. Easily. I like the way uh, he won that race. I just think that he's coming into this race in top form. I think Frankel's got him at his peak right now, and I just think he's going to be very dangerous. The Artie Schiller is the favorite right now. He's a three-year-old. He's three to one. He's only lost once on the turf all year, and that was to Kitten's Joy. I'm going to go for a little exact to box in here. Artie Schiller and nothing to lose. I'm going to put nothing to lose on top, but got to use Artie Schiller. All right, let me get this straight. We're uh, 0 for <laughs> 2 in the win hole. You know and what? And you're, going for an exa and you're going for an exacta? I know. Wide open race. We'll see what happens. <laughs> and it's my journalistic duty to report that, as usual, our handicappers are O for the day so far. Let's see how the uh, cyber cappers are doing with their selections. Artie Schiller, 17%. Six perfections. 15% say she'll do it again. Nothing to lose. Getting 14%. Our handicappers like Whipper, nothing to lose. Back for the Net Jets Mile in just a moment. Welcome back to the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships. Up next, the $1.5 million NetJets Breeders' Cup Mile at a mile on the grass. There's been much discussion about this turf course. It's Bermuda grass, so it can stand the summers here. That's not a usual surface. There's a good look at it. It has a diagonal chute a la Del Mar. 
and many of the aspects of the Santa Anita turf course were incorporated into this one. The Europeans came and inspected it. It's a 7 8 turf course, which means tighter turns, certainly than the Europeans are used to, but the Europeans who inspected it a couple of months before the Breeders' Cup gave it a thumbs up, and uh, several Europeans will try it today. There's a good aerial view of that turf course as we go onto the lawn for the first time. And Chelsea Candy, uh, six perfections. A lot of people uh, forgetting about her, I guess. She's six to one. She was five. Point three one to one last year when she won this race. Can she do it again? I believe she can. She hasn't won a race this year, so a lot of people are backing off her. But her her time form ratings are coming up very much the same as they did last year, and uh, she's actually more lightly raced this year, so she'll be fresh. Her last race points out that she's coming up to this in good shape, and we might point out that she is out of a half sister to Miesk, that name that keeps coming up, the wonderful bloodlines of the uh, uh, Niarcos family and Six Perfections and Pascal Berry. You have to. To remember has only run seven horses in the Breeders' Cup. Her trainer, he's won three, so his average is huge. You see musical chimes there at 22 to 1. The other filly in this race has six perfections now down to five. Musical Chimes actually started her career over in Europe with Andre Fab. She was in a very important grade one winner. She's now here with uh, Neil Drysdale based out in California. And Sheikh Maktoum, her owner, is donating a portion of her earnings for the Race for Education, which is a great cause here. Great debate as to whether or not she would run on the dirt, which distance, maybe the distaff, but here she is going a flat mile on the dirt, she, on the turf rather. She won the oak tree mile very gamely against Colts, and she's back again here. One horse we need to keep an eye on today is Antonius Pius. He's apparently got a little bit of a, uh, a quirkiness about him. He was leading in the Queen Elizabeth at Ascot last month, and all of a sudden just took a turn and headed right for the rail and bounced off it, lost all chance. And he's, he's tending to do something like that in some of his races, so we have to watch for him, and some of these horses may want to see stay clear of him in tight turns today too there's whipper the one horse as they come off the main track onto the turf course let's check in with donna brothers well whipper's a horse who got here late in the week he's had a bit of a reputation in europe for being a little erratic he is not schooled at the starting gate but the um, connections of whipper have requested they have a no handle in the starting gate which means he'll be loaded and the man will back out he'll be left alone in the starting gate to find his position tom of course you guys remember six perfections held up the start last year in the breeders cup mile the starter said that she schooled beautifully, and I talked to the racing manager for her stable, and he said she's been great in Europe. I guess it was just a bad day for her. All right, there's musical chimes. The nine horse going in on the outside with Silver Tree, the two on the inside. As you see, the horses begin to load for the NetJets mile. Typically a wide open race, and a little bit surprising perhaps that the three year old Artie Schiller is a tepid seven to two favorite. As Singletary, the 10 horse in those Chicago Bear colors. Box a little bit of going in now is assisted into the gate. NetJets Breeders' Cup mile at a mile on the turf course, the purse of million five hundred thousand dollars. The six horse Artie Schiller, the favorite at the moment. And as they load into the gate, let's go upstairs now. Well, Tom Durkin will have another Breeders' Cup call. And of course, the very key here in this mile race is that first turn. It's a bulky field, 14 of them, and all of them kind of looking for that same spot to get closest to the inside after a, a run of about 300 yards before they hit this first and a relatively sharp turn here at Lone Star. They're in the gate, and they're off. And it's a good beginning for Soaring Free. Soaring Free now out to be the early leader from the far outside, Mr. O'Brien. Domestic dispute is right there. Soaring Free takes the initiative. No one's running with him early. Whipper's up close, but under a hole toward the inside. Domestic dispute is there. Special ring is in between horses, just a bit off the lead, and in between horses while running along in fourth. Singletary gets a good spot early, drafting behind horses fifth. Silver Tree, a very good spot for him. He's sixth on the inside. Mr. O'Brien is seventh. Defending champion, six perfections, is now eighth. Artie Schiller, now ninth toward the inside. Musical chimes alongside him in tenth. Nothing to lose is three wide racing in eleventh. Then it's Antonius Pius covered up in behind horses. Followed by Diamond Dream. Black Dune is the last of them all. The pace is relatively soft. 24 seconds flat for the opening quarter and the half in 48 and 3 fifths seconds. That does augur well for the front runner soaring free. Special ring to the attack now as they move into the far turn. Whipper right there just in behind the lead. Domestic dispute on the outside. He's third. Singletary still on hold. He's running along in fourth. Mr. O'Brien fifth on the outside. Six perfections is only five links from the lead, but she's got five horses in front of her now. Silver Tree right there ready to roll toward the inside. Nothing to lose with a swooping move on the far outside of Black Dune, and they're off to turn into the stretch. Here's Singletary. Singletary with a blitz to the lead. Singletary in front on the outside of late charge coming from Antonius Pius coming down to the finish. Singletary to catch. Antonius Pius fears in, and just as he did, he lost chance to beat Singletary. Singletary wins it by an extra. 
back over Antonius Pius. Six perfections finished third. Well, a blitz coming off the turn. A perfect ride there for Singletary. Beneath David Flores, they get the job done. When it counted, Singletary bared down. Singletary, the Little Red Feather Racing Stable. John Chatlow's the trainer. David Flores aboard. And Singletary, like the linebacker, as Tom said, blitz to the lead. Remember those great shots they used to have of Mike Singletary zeroing in on his eyes, that intense look? It's kind of hard to imagine, but you could see Singletary maybe giving him that same look as he turned for home and pulled away, then held on over Antonius Pius to win this NetJets mile. Let's go to Donna. <laughs> All right, I got to get lined up with David here, and he seems pretty happy. David, congratulations. Thank you, Dana. I'm so happy. You know, my only one shot that I have, and I'm so proud for, to win for, the, for a good man. He's a good friend of mine, Dan Charles. T tell me about your trip, David. I tell you what, I have a great trip. He rode perfect where I want him to. I just sat right behind the speed, and, and right in the last turn, I can see the spot right there where I was looking, and I just put him in, in the front early. So I just, all I had to just keep working on the track. He's great shape, soft, but it worked out, work out good for us. This was only his second start off of a five-month layoff. Were you at all concerned he might come up a little short in such tough competition? Well, he definitely was short last time, but the trainer, Dan Charles, he said this time he was going to be ready, so I had confidence on that. You wrote him with confidence. Well done, David. Tom. All right, David Flores with his third Breeders' Cup win, and here is how he celebrated as he nurses Singletary home and celebrates his third Breeders' Cup victory. The trainer, Don Chatlos, enjoyed the moment as well. Chatlos saw Singletary take the lead coming off the turn and hold on. He gave him his best rooting power for his first Breeders' Cup victory. Come on, Flores! Open up, baby! Open up! Oh, yes, please hold on! Please hold on! He done it, David! He done it! Not yet, not yet, not yet! He's done it! He's done it! He's done it! <laughs> <laughs> Prayers answered as Singletary holds on. And on that train, on the way with the Baltimore Ravens, where Mike Singletary is an assistant coach, on the way to Philadelphia, tell Deion Sanders, Singletary just won the Breeders' Cup. Singletary, David Flores up after winning the NetJets mile. And uh, Don Chatlos, the Chicago-born, appropriately enough, former assistant to John Sadler and Ron Ellis. The trainer of Singletary. Let's go to Kenny Rice. Thanks, Tom. Jerry Bailey back here, this time finishing third after a pair of seconds earlier. Third aboard the defending champ, six perfections. Jerry, you come into a race with 14 in the field, some tight turns, some trouble can happen. It did with you as you were turning for home. Yeah, you know, actually I made the first turn great from the 11 hole, but turning for home, I was angling her out and to go between horses. And the hole was actually moving a little quicker than I was. I wasn't able to get to it as soon as I wanted to. There you are, what, about four or five wide yeah, out there. It's already happened now. It, you know, she just lost a little momentum, and it's, it's tough to do that on this kind of race. What kind of turf would you uh, rate this right now? I'd say it's closer to good. It's not firm, but it's not yielding. I'd say it's probably good. A little cut in the ground would favor come from behind horses. All right, Jay. Did you, uh, when you were out there, when you were taking a look, did you feel that she had any kind of kick at all to get through that hole at any time? She had enough, but not quite enough. Well, the champ uh, made a good showing for herself. She tried hard. All right, thank you, Jerry Bailey. Jerry Bailey, a couple of seconds and a third now, rides the defending champ, six perfections, the third. Let's go over to Trevor Denman. Well, in a big field like that, going a mile on the turf, the key word for the jockeys is cool. And I don't think there's a cooler rider in the United States than David Flores. Man, he just is ice cool out there. He got the perfect trip. He waited and waited. They opened up nicely for him. Let's go and take a look at it from the top of the lane out here. Let's go right now to Singletary. This is him. He's already found his gap out here but David just sat in behind them waiting the horse on the inside right here is Whipper with the white face he was one of the pacemakers he's going to drop out and there goes Singletary first run now Antonius Pius and Jamie Spencer follow David Flores through there he's got the white face going to chase him home but a huge run from Singletary and guess what he wants exactly a mile he started to slow down that last bit a mile in the 16th they get him he is a literal miler he just loves a mile you see that 30 to 1 long shot Antonius Pius 
closing on the outside but thanks to David Flores they get there and what a race for trainer Dan Chatlos here his very first Breeders' Cup winner and it's a winner for David Chatlos Don Chatlos who really is known as what we call a small time trainer that doesn't mean he can train it just means that he doesn't train many horses in Southern California but he's certainly made a name for himself this afternoon with Singletary a big winner in the Breeders' Cup mile Tom all right, Trevor, and all those worries about the outside post positions on the turf course. Well, the 10 wins, the 11 finishes third, the exact of $1,495. For the presentation, let's go to Mike. And, and Tom, I am having a hard time hearing you with these guys down here. These are some of the happiest owners I've ever seen in my life. That's Don Chatlos, the trainer. This is David Flores. The owners won't shut up to make the presentation to the winner of the Net Jets Mile. President and CEO, Mr. Richard Santulli. Richard. Greg, great, great job. I couldn't be happier for you young guys. It's spectacular, wonderful job. Singletary. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such an honor. This is unbelievable. This is a moment I, I, I'm going to start crying because I never thought this would happen. And uh, Don Chatlos right here, he does such a great job. He's the best young trainer anybody could ever have. And thank you to my grandfather. I know he pushed me and made this happen. All right. Very emotional time down here for all these guys. And Don, you've been pointing to the sky a couple times. Tell us why. Well, these guys are unbelievable. They let me give him the summer off. One race before the Breeders' Cup, we knew that he'd be 100%. And, you know, this plan started the day after the Del Mar Derby last year, and it, it all happened for us. We are so happy. Great. But was it your grandfather that got you interested in racing? Yeah, my grandfather, Howard W. Koch, got me interested in racing. When uh, he, I wish he was here, he would love this. I'll tell you what, <laughs> it's awesome. It really is I awesome. I don't even know what to say, and I'm not usually at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got David Flores buried David, behind yeah, David. everybody yeah, here. David. And David, what uh, Trevor Denham, Denman just talked about how chilly you set the whole time and said you're the cool, one of the coolest riders he's ever seen. You showed it today. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, it's a privilege for me to hear good things from Travel. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Don and Bill and everybody in the team. Um, without this, I don't think I would make it. You know, they give me the confidence, and I was just a passenger on this horse and move at the right time, and thank God we make it through. And I saw you, Don, rooting. I think you started rooting. You say, open up, open up, open up, and then you said, hold on, hold on, hold on, and is the race over? <laughs> That's what it turned into for sure. <laughs> So just a great job. Don, David, Bill, everybody, just a great job. Thank you. Big, Singletary. big win. So, all right, here we go. Singletary. Singletary. Tom? <laughs> They'd be right at home at a football game with Singletary, wouldn't they? Four-year-old Colt by Sultry Song and a Joyski Star by Star and Asker. Bred in Kentucky by Distler Farms Limited and originally sold at the sales for $3,200. You see the complete order of finish in the net jet smile. And when we come back, we'll check in with the Breeders' Cup Sprint. The Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships are brought to you by NetJets. Leave nothing to chance. By FedEx Kinkos, your one-stop for copying, printing, and shipping. By Long John Silver's new Build Your Own Combo. Surf's up, dive in at Long John Silver's. And by Alberto V05 Nourishing Oasis. Restore your hair and spirit. At Lone Star Park, most of the races you'll see today have tactics and strategy, but not here in the six furlong sprint. It's open the gates and let it rip. You're right about that, Bob. You need two things to win the sprint. You need speed and you need racing luck with a big field of 13. And with that in mind, you also need luck to pick a winner. Every year it's wide open. This year, no exception. Only five favorites have won this in the past 20 running. If you had to put a gun to my head, I'd go with our new recruit, but I wouldn't be surprised if five, six, maybe even seven other horses won this race. I, I wouldn't be surprised with five, six horses in here, but our new recruit, that would surprise me. <laughs> the Philly and Mare turf may be the new kid on the block, but it's already decided four Eclipse champions and only five runnings. The formidable European team is led by the dual classic winner, Ouija Boy, who was just a close-up third in the grueling Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. And the American team is led by Light Jig from the seemingly bottomless bench of trainer Bobby Frankel. And it looks like it's going to be a really tough showdown. Texas in October has the feel of Kentucky in May with this year's Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Three of the trainers, Wayne Lucas, Bob Baffert, and Nick Zito, have combined to win nine Kentucky Derbies. 
Lucas brings in a million and a quarter dollar yearling purchase. Consolidator, a grade one winner in Kentucky. Baffert has the best in the West in Roman Ruler. And from New York comes the Zito Train Sun King. Today, they will run for a Breeders' Cup. There's a good chance in seven months from now, they'll be running for the Roses as well. This year's turf race is going to be a little different. It's a mile and a half, as always, but only an eight-horse field. Kittens Joy is even money, but even at even money, it's really hard for me to find a scenario in which this horse gets beat. Eight horses, a mile and a half. I can't imagine him having traffic problems he can't overcome. I look for him to be the winner at the end. Then, pick a winner in the Classic? Good luck. Try these angles. Bet the defending champion. Maybe you like the mayor to beat the boys. How about a three-year-old, the one who ruined Smarty's Triple Crown? Or maybe you should take one of the undefeated horses this year. Or play it safe and select the horse and the good old boys you know. Ah, information overload. The classic should be amazing. And all of that still to come today from the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships, Grand Prairie, Texas, Lone Star Park. The horse is in the paddock now for our next race, the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Juan and Charlie at 28 to 1, Spitestown at 5, so is Champ Ali. Our new recruit is 7 to 1 shot. Keela at 5 to 2. BT's Gray Eagle a long shot, Goldstorm Cuvee, Cajun Beat, my cousin Matt, all long shots, and Midas Eyes at 7 to 2 as we go to Kenny Rice. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm with uh, one half of the owners of the defending champ, Cajun Beat, the father-son combination of Joe and John Irokane. Last year, I see you here, Joe, you're very relaxed. You seem a little more nervous. You were 22 to 1 last year. You're only uh, about 17 to 1 right now. Well, I think there's a lot of expectations in this race for us. I mean, we came back from Dubai. We gave her plenty of time off. We're so excited. So, you know, we really want to do well. Last year, we didn't know what to expect. We were just happy to be here. And uh, humbly, we won, and, and we're just tickled to death about last year. But hopefully, we can repeat. A little deja vu. You've been bringing your son, John, to the racetrack. He's learned quickly. You said he is uh, basically the guy you consult. John, this was the plan all along, to have Cajun Beat ready to be back here for the Breeders' Cup. Went to Dubai. You gave him some time off and came back for the Vosburg. Do you feel everything is the way you wanted it now? We wouldn't change anything. He was kind of wiped out after Dubai. And so we said, hey, let's give him a little time off. Go to Vosburg for a prep, and then we'll be ready to go for the Breeders' Cup. So we're excited. As far as coming into this now, do you know probably that the odds are a little bit against you? It's been uh, 0 for 6 as far as champions are concerned coming back to defend their title in the sprint. Was that any concern when you talked to Mr. Sanan, the other uh, owner here, about everything? Actually not. Satish is a great horse person. He w takes the horse first. He, we gave the horse plenty of time. He insisted we send him down to his farm, which is like a heaven for a horse. And consequently, we gave her every opportunity to get well from Dubai, and here we are. And we're thankful that Satish you know, gave him such a long time off because he, he actually calls the shots for us. All right, guys, good luck today. Joe and John Irokane, father and son that uh, goes to the racetrack, and they've turned it into a little business as well with the defending champ, Cajun Beat, trying to beat the odds once again and win the sprint for a second straight time. Tom? A profitable business at that, Kenny. Let's check in now with Bob Newmeyer. Well, the betting public can be very fickle. Spitestown was 4-5 to five in his last race at the Vosburg in New York after reeling off four straight wins at the sprint distance. He stumbled at the start, finished third. That's the only blemish on his record this year. He'd be the prohibitive favorite if he won that race. To me, he's the horse to beat. And as you can see, he looks magnificent in this paddock. He's a son of Gone West. He's trained by Todd Pletcher, who's uh, off the schneid with the win in the Distaff with a shadow, John Velasquez. They're going over instructions now with uh, Velasquez's uh, legendary agent, Angel Cordero Jr. But Spitestown from the number two post, in my mind, is the horse to beat in the sprint. Mike Vitaglia? All right, thanks, Bob. And uh, Steve Asmussen just got finished saddling Cuvée. And Steve is uh, not only the leading trainer in the country, he's the all-time leading trainer at Lone Star Park. And uh, you told me you tied for leading trainer at Keeneland. You both had a second today. So you're kind of on a roll, Steve. Well, hopefully we are. You know, it's great to have the Breeders' Cup here. And this is home for me. And uh, expect a good race out of both these horses. If anybody would know this track, it would be you. What has the rain done to it? Well, I think that it'll be very fast after the rain. You know, it was a little wet for the first race, but obviously with the sun out like this, we're going to see some fast times. How about your two horses, Buona Charlie and Cuvee? Cuvee is a horse that uh, really has a lot of early speed. He does. You know, um, the way the race sets up is either going to help one and hurt the other, and it's quite obvious one or the other lap. And what about uh, Buona Charlie? He likes to come from off of it, right? He does. You know, the one hole, he's going to have to be lucky to work his way through traffic, but he's a great big horse, and they won't take his spot from him. 
Tell us a little bit about this turf course. It's yielding today. Will that favor the front runners or the horses coming from behind? We already saw one horse come from off to win the mile. I expected them to close real well in the mile. You know, in the longer races, I think that the, the true stayers got an advantage. Really? Thank you. Steve Asmussen, good luck with Buona Charlie and Cuvee. All right, Mike, Steve's uh, dad, Keith, founded a uh, equine empire down in Laredo, Texas, quarter horses and thoroughbreds. Steve, the nation's leading trainer, and of course, uh, one of his other sons, Cash, also was one of the top riders in all the world, mostly in France in the latter part of his career. There's a look at Midas Eyes, trained by Bobby Frankel. He had a six-month break this summer, and he came back to run probably the two best races of his life. Bobby shortened him up, just sprinting him completely, and he just absolutely aired. And he had a tremendous work in New York. He's not a good workhorse, and he worked in 59 flat over a dull racetrack. So the feeling is that he is really set to be absolutely on top of his game. The bad news is he's drawn post number 13. Uh, Bobby's very philosophical about all that. He says, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You know, he didn't wait. He waits till after the race to get upset. But right now, he feels pretty good about Midas Eyes. And as Midas Eyes takes a few turns, there's a look at Champ Ali, who is trained by Greg Foley, his first trip to the Breeders' Cup, and uh, young Rafael Bejarano will be aboard. He's won three graded stakes at three quarters of a mile. He'd always been a useful horse at a distance, but he's really settled into his niche as a sprinter. It's become his forte, and his style is really good for this race and this track. He's kind of a pressing pressing uh, style. He can, he can set the pace if he has to, but he's really better to sit right off what promises to be a pretty fast pace. So Rafael Bejarano is two for two on him. He'll just sit just off the pace and wait to pounce. There's the riders up for this wide open sprint. It's the least formful of the Breeders' Cup races along with the Classic. Only five of 20 favorites have won this race. As you see the current odds at the bottom of the screen, and uh, again, a wide open affair. This sprint, which is six furlongs, the most uh, dominant distance in American racing, pretty much all out to the finish as Edgar Prado gets a leg up on Midas Eyes, and the horses start to make their way toward this Lone Star track. And we've talked about some of the people on the schneid here for no Breeders' Cup wins. Edgar Prado is one of those. He has never won a Breeders' Cup yet. He's burst onto the national dominance in the last handful of years after starting in Maryland and still is looking for his first Breeders' Cup win. Very popular rider, Edgar Prado. By the way, the main track has been upgraded to fast now. As we began the day, it was listed as good, but we said drying out and it would be fast, and indeed it is now fast for this six furlong sprint that carries the purse of a million dollars. Fast is the operative word, Tom. I think the fractions will be ferocious, and I think the final time will probably threaten the track record. And my now it's time for our next tell call to the post. <laughs> Leaving the paddock and heading to the track. Number 10 is Cuvee, the 11 Cajun beat, the defending champion. Cuvée ran here in the Breeders' Cup last year. He went off the favorite in the Juvenile, finished absolutely last. They gave him a long vacation. He's been second in both of his starts back, but has to prove himself against these kind of sprinters. There he is. He's the second horse in this race, trained by Steve Asmussen. He has Juana Charlie and Cuvée. 34 to 1, a long shot, Cuvée. Talking so, there, Robbie Alvarado. Todd Pletcher walking by again as he there's Greg Foley, the trainer of Champ Ali. Fletcher got a shadow to the winner's circle to get his first Breeders' Cup win earlier today. There was a quick look at our new recruit who won the Golden Shaheen over in Dubai. He's a gorgeous, powerful, strong horse and really taken upset in this race. There is Todd Fletcher. He's been among the leading trainers. Saratoga, he has just been lights out the past couple of years, but was 0 for 12 for the Breeders' Cup until today's first race, the Distaff where he got a shot -o home to victory and wrapped up the three-year-old Philly championship. He's walking alongside his horse, Spites Town. Let's go to Kenny Rice. All right, Tom, everyone is uh, making their way out uh, right now at this time. And uh, taking a look at uh, one of the ones here in the sprint is Keela. Mike Mitchell trains him. Jerry Bailey said earlier that uh, he liked the fact that the 
track was drying out. Uh, Mike Mitchell also said he liked the fact that the track was drying out. He wanted a fast surface from there, liked his five position. Felt that coming into this race that uh, Keela was probably the kind of horse that would do well here. Maybe it may be overlooked a little bit, but is coming in off a couple of straight victories from out west and has been over this track before. And that's what uh, Mitchell said is one of the keys to this horse as he was talking about him earlier is the fact that he has been out on the track here at Lone Star Park. That was back in May of this year where he came in fourth. So will that be a little bit maybe of a home court advantage? Uh, Mike Mitchell certainly hoping so today, Tom. And uh, champion jockey Jerry Bailey has been close today but has yet to win a Breeders' Cup race. We'll back up on Cajun beat the defending champion 14 to 1 today. He was 22 to 1 when he won it last year. Post parade now for the Breeders' Cup Sprint, a million dollars. Number one is Buana Charlie. And this is the home team, a three year old owned by former University of Texas football player Bill Heilingbrot. Notice the silks, the lone star of burnt orange on the silks. Looks like Texas colors trained by the Texan Steve Asmussen and bought in Texas as a two year old for 240,000. He is based at Lone Star. Four wins this year. Number two, Spitestown. Texan Todd Pletcher got that first Breeders' Cup win. He is named for the second largest town on Barbados, Spitestown. Equal the 32-year-old track record for six furlongs at Saratoga, 108 flat in winning the Vanderbilt. Number three is Champ Ali, the first Breeders' Cup starter, first millionaire trained by Greg Foley, winner 11 of 20 starts, including the Phoenix at Keeneland. And if you believe in omens, the real Champ Ali, Muhammad Ali, won all three of his fights in Texas. Number four, our new recruit, winner of his last two, the Golden Shaheen, which Charles, you mentioned earlier, that's in Dubai, and the Pirates' bounty at Del Mar. Fastest time in the meet there, 108 and 1. Number five, Keela, has a couple of races over this track. Started only once at six furlongs, as Kenny said, coming from last in a 10 horse field to win the grade one, Bing Crosby. Number six, Abondanza. Pimlico based three year old who beat Juana Charlie in the Hearst Jacobs earlier this year and prepped for the sprint with a victory in the gallant Bob at Philadelphia Park. Number seven is Clockstopper, a closing sprinter who is subject to traffic problems like his last race, a third in the Phoenix at Keeneland, 0 for 4 lifetime at six furlongs, but all in the money. Number eight, PT's Gray Eagle, supplemented for $90,000. He won his first stakes race in his final prep, the ancient title at 29 to 1. The three-year-old was claimed for 62,500 last November. Good claim. Number nine, Gold Storm, Lone Star based. He's won three of four starts here, claimed here for 50,000 last May. And his trainer, Bubba Cassio, former quarter horse trainer who conditioned one of that sport's greatest runners, Dash for Cash. Number 10 is Cuvée, who ran last as the favorite in the juvenile last year and has been second in both his 2004 starts. Steve Asmussen is the trainer. The 11 horse Cajun beat upset winner of the sprint 22 to 1 last year. No horse has won this race twice. Frankel now his trainer sent him out to a fourth place finish in the Vosburg off a six month layoff in his last start. Number 12 is my cousin Matt, a long shot, who has only a single win and six starts this year, claimed for $100,000 in 2002. He's earned over $400,000 the last two years. And 13 is Midas Eyes, eighth in this race last year. He's had two races since February, both wins at Saratoga in a 10-day span, but has never won a race at six furlongs. So a little graphic problem there, some of the wrong silks on the graphics, but you get the idea of the 13 starters that are on the track for the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Well, still trying to pick their first winner, Mike and Bob. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Time to get off Tech. the schneid, partner. We got to. I changed my mind on that last race. Juvenile Phillies, yeah. Juvenile Never Phillies, change yeah. your mind. Never he changed, changed his mind from Sweet Cat of Mine to, to sense, sense of Style, style and you yeah. paid the price. Yep. Anyway. There is a Texas distinct style to this race. You talk to Steve Asmussen, he's right. got Cuvée and Buona Charlie, and Baba Cassio has uh, another horse in Goldstorm that has local connections. And I guess the question becomes, can a Texan win this thing? 
you know, they're going to be long shots, but sure they can. They've got uh, races over this racetrack, and they can, uh, they're trained by good trainers. So, yeah, they can win. Am I going to pick them? No. I'm going for the Kentucky horse. Does that surprise you? Oh, that's a big surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Champ Ali. Roots. Champ Ali. Uh, this horse really has, uh, Greg Fole has done a great job with Champ Ali. Here he is in the Phoenix coming from just off of a very quick early pace. He was spotting horses weight in here. Rafael Bejarano aboard talked about him earlier. This kid can ride. He gets the horse up, and Champ Ali likes, likes the six furlong distance four out of six at the six furlongs and i just think he's in top form right now i'm giving him a very very slight edge i think he can lay right back off the pace i like that tactical speed angle for champ ali i have to go shopping here as well with a price and that would be uh, our new recruit who has taken the same trip to this Breeders' Cup sprint as Cajun Beat did last year. In other words, he had one prep race and then bang into the race. He's two for two this year, won a big race in Dubai in the spring. I think he'll be favorably positioned towards the inside in the second flight and then make that big move on the turn and hopefully hold off the closes. Let's face it, Spites Town, in my opinion, is still the horse to beat in here. I think he's an unbelievable price on the board at four to one. I'm really surprised Kilo, who comes way out of from way out of it from Southern California, got a respect them but spites town if, if you throw out the Vosburg where he stumbled at the start right. is the best horse in this and race. if he wins you know he can challenge for the sprint championship uh, he can uh, challenge pico central for the sprint championship and i think it depends on how he breaks today and how much pressure he gets on the front end and i think on this racetrack those uh, stopwatches will be smoking with the speed in this six furlong wide open competitive sprint huh indeed they will and guys what about clock stopper trained by dallas stewart Cyber campers like Spitestown, Keela, and Midas Eyes. Keela, surprising three to one favorite at the moment. There's the seven horse. That's Clockstopper. Back for the sprint after these words. Field of 13 making its way toward the starting gate for the Breeders' Cup Sprint. A million dollars. Update the odds. Spitestown, seven to two. Now co favorite with Keela. Clock stopper seven to one. The rest are long shots. And then Midas Eyes drawing some support at five to one from the outside post, post 13. Six furlong sprint. Well, they open the gate. You take off around one turn, sprinting to the finish. Chelsea Candy, any particular strategy in a race this short? Go for broke. We've got a half a dozen horses in here with just pure raw speed. The, the sprint is always pretty dazzling. Watch for Spitestown, Champ Alley, Abundanza, Goldstorm, Cuvee, Cajun Beat. They all are going to want to be setting the pace. And there's some good speed right behind them. Our new recruit, PT's Gray Eagle, Midas has to make sure they stay honest. We're going to see some really fast fractions here. All appear to be loading in good order here. Six furlong dash, the ten horse is Cuvee, and the four horse, our new recruit. There's the 11, Cajun Beat, trying to win it back to back with Cornelio Velasquez in the saddle. Five horses, Keela, co favorite with Spites Town. And for the call of the Breeders' Cup Sprint, once again, here's Tom Durkin. Long shot, my cousin Matt goes into line. Another long shot, Abandonza takes a spot in the middle of the field. And Midas Eyes, the last one to go in in this field of quick footed spinners. 13 of them in the gate. And they're off. Midas Eyes, sharp start from the outside. My cousin Matt Cajun Beat is right there. Our new recruit, Abandonza, right there. So too, Kube. Spites Town coming up the inside. A scramble on for the lead. Goldstorm right there in the thick of it, too. Abundanza takes the field down the back stretch. Goldstorm second ahead. Kube third by length. On the inside, Spites Town now back running in third. Our new recruit tailing off in fourth. Cajun Beat fifth and moving on the outside. Minus size is on the move. He's now running into seventh position. On the inside, Champ Ali is now eighth. My cousin Matt is ninth. Keela tenth, but she's asked, he's asked for more run. Twelve lengths from the battle up front. Then Bawana Charlie stretch running PT's Great Eagle. Clock stopper really never got underway. The opening quarter, 21 and one fifth seconds. Astonishing pace here by long shot. Abundanza. Here comes Goldstorm to the attack on the outside. And Spikes Town down at the rail. Those three heading into the final for long together. Spikes Town comes away with the lead. Spikes Town in front. Goldstorm battling on, but he is now spent. My cousin Matt, a long shot threat coming late. Bawana Charlie on the far outside. Keela's coming late too, but it's going to be Spikes Town. Spikes Town wins by two on the wire. Keela comes from way out of it to be so.
second. Long shot, my cousin Matt was third. And there is a pumped up Johnny Velasquez, another perfect ride this afternoon. He just puts on a display here of race riding ability. He cuts the corner with Spites down to win the sprint in 108 flat. All right, Tom Durkin, John Velasquez, uh, one with a shadow in the distaff to start the day. Wins here with Spitestown, who proved to be much the best. As you see that time, 108.11, which would be, as predicted, a new track record here at Lone Star. Spitestown, Pico Central was perhaps the leading sprinter in the country, but his owners chose not to supplement him. And Charles, it will be a tough decision now between Spitestown and Pico Central for the sprint title. They will indeed. Of course, Spitestown had, had run so beautifully. He'd been undefeated all year long until his, his disappointing race up at Saratoga. But now he's back in a big way. And once again, Donna is alongside John Velasquez. Once again, Johnny Velasquez, the winner. Johnny, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Johnny, this horse has won five out of his last seven starts. He set a new course record again today. Pretty amazing. He's amazing. I tell you, I was worried about the, the post inside, but I didn't want to chase him the whole time. I wanted to give him a little chance, and he took it. You know, and then when I sent him there and the, through through the through the rail, he took everything. And when finally we passed that horse on the lead, boy, did it, did it got bigger. He just got very very brave. Speaking of the inside post, he faced a full field of 12 today. The most he's run with in the past several starts has been nine. Did that concern you? Well, I, it concerned me from the beginning anyway because it was there was so much speed in the race, and I don't know how how he was going to handle the dirt in his face. But I wanted to be as close as I could without you know taking him too far back or, ch or chasing him too much. He took it. He showed that he, he was there for me. At what point did you realize you were going to win this? As soon as we got we got to the quarter point and I and I got through and the inside, I knew he. As soon as he got in the clear, he switched the lead and he was sweet on the lane. He just picked it up and let's go on, buddy. Great day for you and Todd. Congratulations, Johnny. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Tom. It looks okay, like okay, Donna. On the road. Second today for Velasquez, his sixth overall, and for Todd Pletcher, who came to Dallas without a Breeders' Cup win, his second of the day. It was not a track record, however. Fast time, though, 108.11 at Spitestown wins the sprint. Spitestown, owned by Eugene and Laura Melnick, and six-year-old horse by Gone West, out of Silk and Cat by Stormcat, bred in Kentucky by Aaron and Marie Jones, ridden by John Velasquez, and Bob Newmeyer is with a man who's happy the Breeders' Cup has come to his home state. That's right, native Texan uh, Todd Pletcher and veterans like Bobby Frankel, as great as trainers as they've been, it took a long time for them to break the schneid in the Breeders' Cup. Now you're second. Todd, what does it mean to you? Well, it's so sweet. You know, uh, this horse, everybody kind of knocked him off one bad race and uh, got some criticism maybe. You know, he wasn't training as well and that sort of stuff. I, I felt like the horse was doing as well as he ever had, and he just didn't handle the track last time at Beaumont, and fortunately that proved out to be right. Now, I know you lost in the Vosburg, but do you believe this effort today should give him the Breeders' Cup Eclipse, not the Breeders' Cup, the Eclipse Award for Champion Sprinter of 2004? Well, the thing is, Pico Central and Spike Sound both have one loss this year. This is the marquee race. This is the world championship. This is beating everybody except for him. So, you know, in my eyes, you got to show up on the biggest day if you want to be the champion. And I think Spike Sound proved today he is. And you got an inside trip with John Velasquez. I know the, the box kind of concerned you at the beginning. You thought you had to send. You wound up in the second flight, which might have been a break. Turned out to be a blessing. You know, John rode a beautiful race. It opened up at the top of the stretch, and the horse, the horse punched when he needed to. Great. Thank you. Todd Pletcher, trainer of Spike Town. Tom? Bob as the uh, first and second choices run one two in the Breeders Cup Sprint spites down a two million dollar Keeneland yearling pays nine forty five twenty and four dollars Keela was second my cousin Matt third and the exacta paid forty one sixty and the time uh, after the second fastest half mile of all time, 43.47, was just a couple of ticks off the track record. We set a track record, but just off it, 108.11. Saddle comes off, John Velasquez. And uh, Swightstown gets the blanket. We'll head back for his bath. It was interesting, Tom, after the, you know, the fast early fractions materialized that we expected, but then the last eighth of a mile, they backed up pretty good and wound up running it in 12 and change. But still, he was an easy winner, and it was a very sharp sprint. John Velasquez weighs in, and Spitestown heads for the stable. 
a gorgeous big horse. He, he looked very well here the, both mornings on the track and seemed to handle it well and obviously was quite at home here in Texas. Six year old horse by Gone West. And here's the official order finish. Spitestown wins it. Keela, my cousin Matt, defending champion Cajun Beat, fifth in his repeat attempt. And you see the other finishers, Midas Eyes, who got a lot of support at the windows, winds up in 10th place. Let's go to Trevor Denman. All right, well, as we said before the race, you know, there was, luck was going to play a part. An unlucky runner-up here was Keeler. He just had no option. He had to go eight, nine horses wide on the outside. We're going to look right at the, towards the rear here in the blinkers as Keeler. That's him almost at the back of the pack. Now, Jerry Bailey just sees a wall of horses in front of him. Meanwhile, Spites Town not to take anything away from him. Down on the inside here, cuts the corner. And a look at Keeler in the gold cap, extreme outside. You could count somewhere between seven and nine horses wide. Look at him take off here. He's passing a horse per stride. I looked, he was about six lengths back at the eighth bowl, and he closes the gap with each and every stride. Again, not to take it away from Spites Town, a great win, but I would say say Keeler was unlucky today if he could have gone three or four wide I, in my opinion he might have got up there to catch Spites down so good win and Keeler a good run from second Tom all right so Spites down makes his claim for the sprint championship this year and down in the winner's circle we're going to have the presentation with a special guest, Jeremy Warner. You Olympic fans remember the 400-meter and 4x400 relay member team at the Olympics in Athens, the gold medalist who goes to Baylor University in Waco. Here he is in the Olympic trials as he come on, come on to uh, win that race, went to Athens and won two gold medals. He used to be a valet parking attendant here at Lone Star, and he's in the winner's circle to help with the presentation. Mike? Thanks, Tom and Jer Jeremy Warner. It's fitting that he should present the trophy to the sprint winner as quick as Jeremy is. Eugene and Laura Melnick are the owners. Of course, Todd Pletcher, Johnny Velasquez. Along with Jeremy, we've got the president of the NTRA, the commissioner, I'm sorry, D.G. Van Cleef, and the president of Lone Star Park, Corey Johnson. And D.G., you're going to do the talking? Okay. It's a, <laughs> Mike, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to co-present with our 400-meter uh, a uh, gold medalist in the 2004 Olympics, Jeremy Warner, and track president, Corey Johnson. Uh, Eugene, congratulations on your champion. Wonderfully done. Thank you very much. Eugene, this horse now has won five out of six this year. Everybody's been talking about Pico Central, the champion sprinter. What do you think? Well, I think uh, the championship was today, and uh, here at Lone Star, we didn't have uh, Pico show up, but I tell you, Sp uh, Spice Town showed up and uh, showed us what he's got. Showed up, he did. He was very impressive. Uh, great ride again by Johnny Velasquez. Johnny did a great ride. It was a smart ride. He uh, held back a little bit, and you got to hand it to him for the ride, and you had to hand it to uh, Todd for making uh, you know this horse what he is. Definitely, Todd. Now two two wins in the Breeders' Cup. First, we'll get to Johnny here. You got your good luck charm with you. I think you got to bring her to the races every day. She's coming with me all the time now. <laughs> from now on, she's not staying home anymore. Don't leave home without her, Johnny. Tell me about the trip. That's right. We didn't break as well as we wanted to, uh, but although I wanted to get a good position after that. Uh, chase him a little bit, a little bit out of there just to get a good position where he didn't get that much dirt. Uh, and then from there, you know, I was inside, so I wanted to save as much ground as I wanted to, and, and I wasn't taking that much dirt in there. And the hole was in there. I had the horse to, uh, you know, to squeeze in there. I asked him to do it. He was there for me. He showed up to the, uh, he showed up today for me. So he was great today. He has a lot of heart. And Todd, pleasure again. Congratulations. I know you talked to Bob Newmeyer, but to win two races here in Texas, got to be big. Two Breeders' Cups anywhere is big, but yeah. uh, especially here. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. What do, you, what do you think about the Sprint Championship? Well, it's like we all said. You know, today's the World Championship event. You uh, you figure you got to show up on these days if you want to be champion, and I think this horse, you know, proved today he's, he's the best. Show up he did. Spites Town, a very impressive winner of the Breeders' Cup Sprint, Tom. All right, Mike, as uh, the crowd once again gathers around uh, the walking ring in the paddock, as the next race will be upon us shortly, the VO5 Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf back to the grass course. And here are the odds. Light jig at 7 to 2. Risk averse 12 megahertz 10. Yesterday is 6 to 1. Wonder again is 8 to 1. That's the uh, morning line odd rundown for the Philly and Mare Turf. We know horses come to the Breeders' Cup from all over the world, but the easiest way to do it, well, here's Tom Durkin. you see a FedEx plane, one normally thinks, there goes my package, or someone's anyway. 
But in Dallas this week, a different kind of package was delivered via FedEx. Because amidst the boxes of birthday presents, the piles of overnight business letters, standing on four legs in an air stall, accompanied by her groom, is the German bread, Aubon. And just like any other overnight package, the recipient must sign. Here's your horse. Sign here. Because when they open the gate for the filly and mare turf, Aubon absolutely, positively, has to be there. <laughs> her journey not quite over yet, though. She still has to walk from the paddock to the track. And then the best part of her journey, it'll be the filly and mare turf, a mile and three-eighths on the grass. If she gets there on time, it'll be a big payoff. Welcome back to Lone Star Park, Grand Prairie, Texas, and the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships. An eventful day already with uh, a lot of Texas connections coming through. Here are the current odds for the next race, the VO5 Philly and Mayor Turf with Ouija Board, the four to five favorites. First time we've had a horse in any of our races today, less than even money. Light Jig at nine to one, Megahertz nine to one. Yesterday at 10 and Wonder again at 12 to one. And Charles C. Candy had a chance to see a Ouija board in this race, and uh, she's a pretty remarkable filly. Uh, she's a lovely filly. She's a dual classic winner. She both won both the oh, English there. and Irish Oaks, and then she was a very oh, close-up third against the boys in the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, which is the most grueling, most prestigious race in the world. And she she ran huge, and she's shipped here now. It's only been a three weeks since she ran there. She's shipped here. She looks well considering the campaign, and she's a beautiful filly, very lovely, very balanced. She's rather elegant. You wouldn't think she's uh -huh. as tough a tomboy <laughs> as she is, but uh, is she Karen Fallon aboard. And the, he, she does her best running for Karen Fallon. The thing we have to watch with her is, is the start. She has a tendency to, to hesitate at the start, or dwell, as we say. And if she, she really doesn't need to do that here today. But if she runs her race back, as she did in the arc, she will be should be all over these hillies. Very simple colors, wearing the black with a white hat of Lord Darby. The 19th Lord Darby is the owner. Let's go to Bob Newmeyer. Tom, in the history of the Breeders' Cup, sons or daughters of Sadler's Wells have pocketed 6.7 million. That's the most of any stallion. And number 11 yesterday is a daughter of Sadler's Wells. Third in this race last year. She was sick early in the spring, had colitis, nearly died. Has had two runs to try and get her ready for this race. The second was better than the first. If she's fit enough, she could give Ouija Board a run for her money, Tom. There's a look at yesterday with Jamie Spencer in the saddle. And Bobby Frankel's trainee light jig, one of the top uh, U.S.-based horses in the race with Renee Douglas in the saddle. There he is in the Judmont colors. Light Jig really didn't run all that well in France. Uh, she was, of course, bred and owned by Judd Mott, began her career over there, and then she was sent to California to Bobby Frankel, and she has just blossomed out there. She won the yellow ribbon in her last start. All of her wins in this country have come in California. She'll tackle a wider variety of fillies today, but she certainly is in line to run very well. Bobby Frankel working on a disappointing day right now. He nothing to lose, and Midas has both. I have to have been major disappointments to him, so a lot riding on light jig. Also, of course, Megahertz in here, so he's got two tries. 